Oh, my sweet little Jake. I'm glad you're back. I missed you so much. These were the first few words I heard from my mom after a seriously long sleep. But why couldn't I move my body? Oh, my God. Was I paralyzed? A doctor appeared and told me everything. Oh, Jesus. I'd been in a coma for five months. Yeah, you heard me right. Not five days, not five weeks, but five freaking months. The good news was that I wasn't paralyzed. I just needed some therapy to strengthen my muscles. So you're probably wondering how I ended up in a coma. Me too, so I asked my mom. Sweetie, you had your headphones on and you were singing along to some tune. You were so loud I could hear you outside while I was gardening. So I waved at you to quiet down, but you tripped over your sneakers, fell out the window, and knocked your head on the flower pot. What? That was so dumb. Why couldn't it have been something cool like I took on a mugger or tackled a shark or something, huh? Anyway, therapy became the norm for me. But where were my dad, my girlfriend Jenny, and my best friend Ben? None of them visited me, not even once. And they were all ignoring my calls and messages. I asked mom about it, and she told me dad was on a business trip. Ben had moved towns, and I'd already broken up with Jenny before the coma. Huh? We'd broken up? That couldn't be. I didn't remember us breaking up. In fact, the last thing I do remember was sending her a cheesy meme of a cat and telling her she was perfect. <laughs> Boy, this sucked. Finally, I was discharged from the hospital. My first stop was Jenny's house. I pounded on the door, and eventually she stuck her head out and said, J Jake? You're awake? Yeah, exactly. I'm awake. I asked her why we'd split up and she shook her head and told me we hadn't. The only reason she hadn't answered my calls was that she thought it was a joke. Then she told me to go home, as she was busy at the moment, and then she closed the door on me. Weird. But at least we hadn't broken up. Maybe she was nervous. Oh, and she wanted to do her hair and makeup to look pretty in my eyes. Well, that must be it. It made total sense now. <laughs> Girls are weird sometimes. So I had school tomorrow, but I knew I needed to catch up on the happenings of the world first. So I went online and did some research. What? Pass me the tissues as I was about to cry. My favorite TV show, Supernatural, was over. For real this time? Oh my god. After 15 years, how could they? Oh wow, there was more. Trump wasn't the president anymore. And what's with all this dancing on TikTok? It all gave me a headache, so I went to bed. The next morning at school, I walked into class and everyone rushed over to me and hugged me and high-fived me. Well, except for Ben. Jeez, talk about a lousy friend. But hang on, wasn't he meant to move towns? So having my charm, good looks, sporting talents, and the hottest girlfriend in the school made me a super popular guy. No wonder everyone seemed so delighted to see me. It was good to be back. But then my teacher arrived, glared at me, and told me I was in the wrong class. I'd been pushed back to junior year because I'd missed too much school. What? I couldn't graduate with my classmates? Bummer. I sat down with these juniors and oh god. It looked like Dwayne The Rock Johnson was sitting in a kindergarten class. They all looked like little kids in comparison to me. I've never been so relieved for lunch break in all my life. I hurried to the canteen and saw Jenny, so I hugged her from behind. Huh? Why did she have a balloon under her shirt? I stared at her belly in shock. Yup, my girl was pregnant. She burst into tears and started apologizing. The room started to spin, and before I knew it, I'd fainted. I woke up in the hospital, again. I was seriously getting sick of this place. The doctor said I should take it easy and avoid stress at any cost. Oh well, I just found out my girlfriend was pregnant after I woke up from a freaking coma. Tell me how am I supposed to not be stressed now? After that, mom took me home. Dad was there. It was so good to see him. I hugged him, but he gave me this awkward look and told me he was only there to pick up some things. Huh? Where was he going now? And that's when my parents told me the shocking news. They were divorced. What? I mean, I knew they argued sometimes, but this was absurd. Something must have happened while I was in a coma. And what's with my dad's attitude? He barely looked at me. This was weird. It felt like I'd woken up from my coma in a parallel universe or something. Little did I know that it was about to get a lot crazier. The next day at school, I saw Ben's car pull up in front of the entrance. Then he opened the passenger door and helped Jenny get out. Oh, hell no. Now everything was clear. I ran toward them and did a Mortal Kombat punch right in Ben's nose. Damn, it felt good. But it did land us both in detention.
I had to sit in a room with that jerk for an entire hour. I couldn't hold it in anymore and needed to confront him. He just shrugged and replied, We thought you were never going to wake up again. Jenny was devastated, so I took care of her for you. Was he serious? He took care of her by getting her pregnant? <laughs> Great job, buddy. There was no way I was ever talking to him again, and I was kicking him out of the basketball team. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that I'm the captain. The next day I strolled into practice and shouted, Yo, your captain's back, and he will lead this team to victory. I expected cheers, but nope. They all stayed quiet and stared down at their feet. Then the coach came over and told me I was off the team for a whole six months. Doctor's orders. And guess who the new captain was? Yeah. No other than my amigo, Ben. Let me get this straight. I was in a coma, so my best pal Ben over here stole not only my girl, but also my position as captain? Wow. Someone put me back in my coma, please, thanks, because this life sucks. No wonder my mom told me he'd moved away. I wish he had. I was so mad and I needed to talk to somebody, so I went to my dad's house. I was about to knock on the door when I heard voices between my dad and a woman coming from inside the house. I sneaked over to the window and started to film them on my phone. But wait a minute. This wasn't some random chick. It was Jenny. We can't hide this from Jake forever. Nonsense. He'll never find out unless you tell him, so keep up the act. Here's the money for this month. Now go. Oh. My. God. I couldn't believe it. Okay, let me put all the pieces together. My dad had an affair with Jenny and the baby was his. So my mom found out and divorced him. Then she lied to protect me. But dad didn't want the baby, so Jenny tricked Ben into believing it was his. Now everything makes sense. Luckily, I had the footage of his traitorous antics. So it was time to threaten him with it. After all, being a local politician, the last thing he would want was for this to get out. I set up a fake email and attached the video with the message, I know your dirty secret and I'm going to make you pay. He immediately replied that he would pay me $10,000 for the footage. I told him to meet me in the park at midnight to discuss it. I also sent the video to Jenny and told her that unless she wanted this to go viral, she had to go to the park. I got there early and spent a couple hours hiding in a bush while I waited for them. They looked surprised when they saw each other, but nothing prepared them for me hobbling out of the bush. Ouch, leg cramp and saying, Well, what do we have here? My dearest father and my loving girlfriend having a baby together. I took my phone out and continued. How could you do this to me and mom? I thought it's only right the world get to see this and learn what you're really like. My dad begged me to stop, but I was so mad. So mad that I was about to upload it from my phone when Jenny suddenly shouted. Will you just tell him the truth already? Oh God, there was more? My dad sighed and began to tell me everything. Brace yourselves, it's more dramatic than a soap opera. My parents didn't divorce because of Jenny. They had issues for a while but only stayed together for me. So without me around, they split for good. But dad wasn't having a fair. The baby wasn't his and it wasn't Ben's either. Nope, it was mine. But dad knew his son becoming a dad at such a young age would look bad for his career. So he was paying Jenny to fool Ben into thinking it was his baby. Oh my God, these people were mad. This was too much to deal with, so I ran out of there. I locked myself away in my room and tried to figure it all out. The coma had been bad. But the worst part of it all was that the people I cared about most in the world betrayed and lied to me. The next day, Jenny came to my house and asked if we could get back together. Of course, I agreed. Ha! Huh, just kidding. My actual answer was, hell no, not in a million years. I mean, come on, let's do the math, shall we? First, she left me for money. And second, she had an affair with my best friend. We were over for good, but I will continue to support her and always be there for our kid. Ben tried talking to me a few times, but I don't want to hear anything he has to say. There's no way I'm ever being friends with that lying jerk ever again. I'm still annoyed that mom lied to me, but I guess I don't blame her. She did it with the best intentions. And she just wanted to protect me. Besides, when the going got tough, she was the only one who stayed by my side. As for dad, it's going to take a long time for me to fully forgive him, but I'm trying. I mean, he did some pretty awful things, but at the end of the day, he's still my dad. So that's pretty much it. Crazy, right? A coma took everything from me, but also revealed the true faces of the people around me. Now I've decided to follow two rules in my life. One, be extra careful of who I put my trust in. And two, never sing near an open window ever again. So, the data needs to be collected by Friday so we can...
I lowered my head and stuffed a pretzel into my mouth. Danny, are you eating? My boss glared back at me. I wiped my mouth onto the back of my hand and with cheeks full of food muffled out, no, no, of course not. It turns out my eagerness to eat a delicious, salty, crunchy pretzel during a work meeting, I'd forgotten to turn my microphone off. Oops. Hey, so I'm Danny and I'm in love with food. Why, you ask? Well, food's the one thing that's always been there for me. Through the good times and the bad, it's never let me down. All it takes is a hamburger with extra cheese and a salted caramel cheesecake, and I'm a happy girl. Gee, I'm salivating just thinking about it. But then my love of food almost cost me everything. Here's how. So after the pretzel incident, my boss fired me. Harsh. I know. This left me with no job, and as a result, no money to buy tasty snacks. What a bummer. One night, I was lounging on the couch, watching a movie and daydreaming about eating a triple chocolate sundae, when Jake, my boyfriend, sat down next to me with a huge bowl of candy and started telling me about his work colleague's birthday party. Ooh, candy. I grabbed a handful and started shoveling it into my mouth. Thanks, Jake. He knew the way to my heart. In between munching, I asked him, Can you bring a plus one? I want to go with you. Please? He shrugged and said, Sure. I clapped my sticky hands together. Ooh, a party! This was so exciting, as parties meant there'd be food and lots of it. As soon as we arrived there, I made a beeline for the buffet table. OMG! This was amazing. There were club sandwiches, mini pizzas, and potato salad bowls. I lifted the entire serving bowl up and started spooning the food into my mouth. Then some woman appeared next to me, frowning. She said, um, excuse me, please, can you not eat out of the serving bowl? With my mouth full, I replied, oh, s sorry, it, it tastes so good. Then I placed the bowl back down and grabbed a handful of potato chips. As she walked away, I heard her mutter under her breath, what a greedy guts. Eventually, Jake grabbed my arm and led me out of there. He was sulking and could barely meet my eye. So I asked him what was up. What's up? He grunted. Do you even need to ask? You sit around all day eating everything out of the cupboards. Then when I bring you along to my colleague's party, you hog the buffet? It was so embarrassing. This bummed me out. Um, I guess maybe I could have a little more self-control around party food. And I guess I did need to find a job. Besides, having money meant I could buy better snacks, and I wouldn't have to keep on taking Jake's. So I got a part-time job at my local cinema, on the popcorn counter. Mmm, that sweet, buttery popcorn smell. How I adored it. I couldn't help it. It was there staring at me, in all of its warm, golden stickiness. So in between serving a customer, I sneakily stuffed some into my mouth. What are you doing? My heart stopped as I heard a familiar voice behind me. I turned around and came face to face with my manager. I denied immediately. I, I wasn't doing anything. As popcorn popping out of my mouth, they shouted at me and accused me of eating all the profits. So unfair. So you guessed it, I was fired. Again. I arrived home early with a tear-stained face and a bag full of my favorite chocolate treats to cheer me up. Jake looked over at me from the couch and asked me what was up. I slumped down next to him, pulled the wrapper off a chalk bar, and said, I got fired again. I couldn't help it. it. It's popcorn. It's too tasty. Does this world need to be so cruel? Then I took a bite out of the chocolate. Mmm, delicious. Jake shook his head, then sighing, said, Danny, admit it. It's your gluttony that gets you into trouble. So what? I enjoy eating, that's all. It doesn't hurt anyone. I finished the chalk bar and started unwrapping the next one. Jake shook his head, then walked off. Whatever. I didn't need his support, as I had delicious chocolate to comfort me. Yum. One day, like every other day, I searched the house for snacks. But nope, there weren't any anymore. I didn't have any money, so I couldn't go to the shop. So instead, I went on my phone and searched mukbang videos to kill some time. As I watched two girls stuff their mouths full of french fries dipped in a strawberry shake, I had an idea. 
Of course. Why hadn't I thought of this earlier? I should become a mukbanger. I'd get to earn money while doing what I love, eating food. It was a win-win. For my first video, I kept it simple. It was just me in a white t-shirt, my phone as a camera, and a huge bowl of spaghetti. Crazily, people watched it and began following me. After a couple of videos, my popularity increased and my viewers started donating food and money to me. It was totally nuts. But with these things came the video requests, such as eat three tubs of fried chicken and ten plates of fried rice covered in mayo. Eating all this food did get kind of challenging. Once I was halfway through a hamburger eating video when I got a stitch in my stomach and had to stop. I so shouldn't have eaten pancakes for breakfast earlier. My fans were bummed out that I stopped the challenge, and I felt really bad. I figured that if I was going to make this my job, then I'd have to start fasting beforehand, so I could be at my best for the videos. Gee, this was hard work. One time I was so hungry, I went into the fridge and sniffed the cheese. But then when I finished a challenge, I felt so full and bloated that I resembled a puffer fish. Then there was the tiredness. I was so exhausted. I fell asleep on the bus to the supermarket and ended up in some weird town miles away. I had to ring Jacob to come and pick me up and he grumbled about it for the whole way back. Regardless of this, I carried on with the videos. But then one day a fan challenged me to the biggie, the fire noodle challenge. If you don't know what this is, then basically it involves a massive bowl full of the spiciest noodles ever. I took a mouthful of the noodles and OMG, I couldn't feel my tongue or face. My nose was running and I had to stick my tongue out to check if it was still there. This was just too much. There's no way I could endure any more of this. So I switched the bowl for non-spicy noodles and pretended I was eating the hot ones. Afterward, I edited the video and hey, I think I did a great job of faking it. Even though I'd only had one mouthful of the spicy stuff, it was repeating on me. My stomach gurgled and my tongue still felt numb. I lay on the couch with a hot water bottle pressed to my stomach and feeling sorry for myself. Jake sat down next to me and gave me a concerned look. Danny, you gotta stop this video thing and get a real job. With my swollen tongue, I managed to sputter out, Eating on videos is a real job. Jake shook his head. Gluttony is not a hobby. Everyone's just laughing at you. Um, hello. I was being paid for eating, and these videos help many lonely people out there to have company during a meal. They were laughing with me, not at me. Jeez, Jake was so boring at times. Between the spicy noodle challenge and some weird bug eating challenge in which I used jelly worms covered in chocolate instead of the real deal, faking became the norm for me. Soon the articles started circulating saying I was a fake eater. Posts such as, she's faking all the time, and no wonder she's still in shape, popped up everywhere. After that, I had no choice but to live stream eat. Lots of my fans encouraged this, but it was hard work. It didn't take long for the weight to pile on, and within a month, I was up two dress sizes, and I felt super sluggish. One morning when Jake saw me searching my wardrobe for something, anything to wear that would fit me, he suggested we go jogging. I stared down at my favorite jeans that I now couldn't get past my thighs and agreed to go. I had made it to the end of the block and, whoa, it was hot and, ugh, I couldn't breathe. I was crouched over, clutching a fence for support when a pregnant woman walked by. You're such an inspiration. Running at your age and after giving birth, even without this one, she clutched her bump. I wouldn't be able to manage it. What? Did she think I'd just had a baby and I was old? Oh, great. And now Jake burst out laughing too. I felt terrible. Did I really look that bad? This lingered in my mind, so I ended up going online and ordering some weight loss pills. I started taking them and within a week I had breakouts, stinky breath, awful wind, and I felt like a slug. Then one time I was in the kitchen taking the pills when Jake walked in saw what I was doing, snatched them out of my hand, and said, Danny, look at you. You're a mess. You have to stop the pills and stop the videos. I was angrier than a nest of disturbed wasps, so I snatched the pills off him and kicked him out of the room. Then I yelled, 
You don't get it. Just leave me alone. Jake didn't say much to me after that, and I carried on with my mukbang bubble. Soon I hit 100,000 subscribers, and to celebrate, I went live with the table packed full of my favorite foods, fried chicken, pizza, donuts, and so on. I was stuffing my face when I felt so hot and sticky, the room began to spin. I slurred out, I, I don't feel so good. Then I fainted in the middle of a live stream. I woke up a few hours later in the hospital with a drip in my arm and a serious faced doctor glaring down at me. They told me that I had high cholesterol and if I carried on like this, I'd end up with diabetes and stomach bleeding. Well, that was it. I burst into tears and vowed that I would make some big changes. I love eating. That will never change. But I just can't do the mukbang videos anymore. Now, I still enjoy food, but I don't overindulge anymore. Oh, I also have a new job working in a restaurant, and amazingly, I've managed to resist eating all of the tasty-looking food. I'm on the way to becoming the cute, confident version of myself again. And from now on, if I'm happy, sad, or whatever, well, I talk to Jake about it instead of turning to food. I will always love food, but I guess I eventually figured out that I love my health and Jake even more. Shh, don't tell him that. It'll give him a big head. Hey you! Quit standing there and come clean my locker already! You're destined to be a maid, just like your mom! Suddenly, a whole group of kids erupted into laughter, and I just froze. I glanced back, wondering how they knew my secret, but then I realized they were mocking some other girl. Phew, what a relief! This new school seemed intense, and when I walked into the classroom, Three of my new classmates wouldn't stop staring at me, but I just ignored them. But at lunch, one of them came over to me and said, I guess your family is super rich, right? I didn't know what to say, so I just replied with, Um, no. No, they're kind of normal. Why? Then he raised his voice. How dare you try to sit here then? This is our table. Move! I immediately got up and ran to an empty seat on the corner table. That's when some kid told me that the three rich kids were Brent, Sophia, and Jasmine. He told me that the best way to stay out of trouble was to avoid them at all costs, because their parents basically funded the whole school, and so everyone had to respect them. But I couldn't avoid them, because the very next day, Sophia came running up to me and said, Why do you keep your family a secret? Come on, spill! I freaked out. Why did she suddenly ask me that? But then Jasmine appeared and said, Girl, that bag you wore yesterday is totally sold out. How did you get your hands on one? Oh, right. They were probably talking about my Insta post from yesterday. And so I said, Oh, my dad bought it for me in Paris. Sophia's eyes went wide and she said, OMG, your dad is so cool. Why are you wearing it today? Shoot. They were going to catch me out. I had to think fast. Um, my parents don't want me to show it off, so they said I can't bring it to school. Sophia and Jasmine burst out laughing and said my family sounded cool but weird. If only they knew the truth. The bag wasn't even mine. It was just from a modeling job I did to make some extra pocket money. In fact, my parents were super poor. My mom worked as a maid and my dad was a security guard. Obviously, I couldn't afford fancy designer bags, but the rich kids didn't need to know that, right? At lunch, I saw them walking towards my table, and Brent said, What do your parents do? Just tell us. We won't tell anyone. I told them my dad was the CEO of a big fashion company, and my mom worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I wasn't proud of my lie, but the alternative was being treated like the girl I saw on my first day at this school. And I didn't want that at all. They all looked amazed, and Jasmine said, That makes sense why you're so pretty and smart. Then Brent jumped in and said, But then why are you a scholarship kid, hmm? I just smiled and kept quiet. I couldn't think of a good lie, and didn't want to take this any further. 
I thought they would leave me alone after that, but they kept approaching me and even started to ask me to join them at the rich kids' table. I couldn't say no, but when they asked me to hang out on weekends, I made up excuses. Not because I didn't want to join, but because there was no way on earth I could afford it. I didn't even dare to ask my parents, as they were working so hard to save up for my college tuition. I was so afraid of my lies catching up with me, so whenever I modeled for high-end stuff, I'd post a pic to my Insta. One time, I shared a photo of me wearing super expensive heels and captioned it, Thanks, Dad. Love you. Sometimes, I even took it to the next level and edited travel photos, so it looked like I'd spend the weekend in Paris. And one time, I even photoshopped me driving in a Lamborghini. It was a lot of effort, but it was better than being mocked for being poor, like what happened to me in my last school. I couldn't go through that again. One time, I decided to go shopping with them, and it was crazy to watch them buying everything in sight without even thinking about it. I couldn't even dream of a life like that. But when we got to the bag shop, Jasmine pointed to a fancy-looking bag and said she'd bought it yesterday. Then she asked me, You probably already have it, right? I just grinned and said, Yep, my mom bought it for me last time she was in Milan. But then Jasmine said, Yay! Okay, cool. So let's both wear them on Monday. Everyone will be jealous. That weekend, I felt sick. I had to buy that bag. I decided to raid my piggy bank, but when I got to the shop, I realized I only had one-tenth of the amount needed. I was so shocked. Who would spend that much on a bag? While I was standing there, a woman came in and bought it without hesitation. Why was it so easy for rich people? I decided to follow her just out of curiosity and saw her going to the restroom. I couldn't believe it. She just left her new bag by the sink and then went into the cubicle. I looked around and saw the coast was clear. So I quickly grabbed the bag and walked out of the restroom. I ignored the guilt about stealing it from her and headed home. All I could think about was what would happen if I walked up to school on Monday without the bag. But as soon as I reached my room, the regret was eating away at me. Would I go to jail if they find out? My parents would kill me. Well, Monday morning rolled around and I proudly wore my new bag to school. Brent, Jasmine, and Sophia were so surprised and said I had the limited edition version, which was twice the price as the normal one. This made me feel even more guilty, but from the looks I got all day, it was worth it. Everyone saw me as one of the rich kids now. Soon it would be summer vacation, and Brent said he had a holiday house in Hawaii and suggested we all go for one week together. No way I could afford that. So I lied and said I had to go to Paris with my dad for an event. But then Jasmine said her parents were away, so we could have a party at her house instead that weekend. She suggested we dress up and said she couldn't wait to see my clothes I wore outside of school. Oh no, I was dreading this. Brent said he would pick me up at home and drive me there, but I told him to meet me at school instead, as my parents were so strict. Oh my gosh. All of this lying was making me feel exhausted. But no way could I let them see my dilapidated old house, especially as I'd lied and told them we lived in a villa with a pool and golf course. My lying was becoming a big problem. I mean, where would I get a dress from? I lay there worrying about it, and suddenly I heard my parents talking in their room. My mom was saying she'd finally saved enough to send me to college and asked my dad if he could deposit it in their bank tomorrow, as she had to work at some party. Then she said she'd been keeping it in her closet for safekeeping. I thought about it for a while. I mean, the money was for me anyways, right? So what harm would it do if I just took it now? The next morning, I snuck into their room and took all of the money and rushed out to the mall to buy a gorgeous purple dress and sparkly shoes. This was absolutely the life that I deserved. After that, I took an Uber to school, where Brent, Jasmine, and Sophia picked me up. I had like a million missed calls from my mom and dad, but I ignored it and turned my phone off. I just wanted to enjoy a full day living like a true rich kid. Brent drove us towards Hampton's Country Club, and I couldn't believe it. Jasmine's family owned this place. 
Wow! When we arrived, a valet came over, but Brent was so rude to him, he shouted at him and said, Listen, buddy, this car cost four million dollars. If you even leave one tiny mark, you'll be paying for it for the rest of your life. I turned around to see the valet's reaction. Then my jaw almost hit the floor. It was my dad! He saw me and looked surprised, but before he could say anything, we walked off. We hung out in the country club for a bit, then in the evening, we drove to Jasmine's house. Her place was insane! She had a tennis court, her own cinema, and don't even get me started on how many cars her family owned. We sat down to eat in the dining room, and I kid you not, there were four maids waiting to serve us. We each had our own one. I was too busy being shocked to notice my maid walking towards me, but then I heard a familiar voice. Sweetie, what are you doing here? Mom? I was horrified. The party she'd mentioned yesterday. This was the party. Oh no, this was a disaster. Jasmine looked surprised and said, Do you know her? So I said, Oh, she used to be a maid at our house. My mom looked crushed and said, A maid? How could you say that? Then Jasmine got annoyed and said, Don't you dare speak to my guest like that. Get out of my sight. My mom ran off, almost in tears. And for the next little while, Brent and Sophia treated her terribly too. Brent even asked her to clean his shoes. My mom was being treated like this all because of me. I could see she was really upset and she accidentally dropped some sauce on Jasmine's dress. And then Jasmine just lost it. She pushed my mom and screamed, Are you crazy? Do you know how much this dress cost? Well, that was it. I'd had enough. I ran over and helped her up. Mom, are you okay? Mom? Jasmine, Brent, and Sophia all shouted. So I said, Yes, she is my mom. And how dare you treat her like that? Tears were pouring down my cheeks, and I felt so humiliated. Needless to say, they kicked us out, and Jasmine even threw some $10 bills at us and said, Take it. Go back to your broken-down house. You're stinking up our air. I couldn't stop crying. It was exactly how they treated that girl on my first day at school. I didn't have much choice but to tell my parents the truth that I'd lied to everyone, stolen the bag, and even stolen their money just so I could pretend to be rich. I'd never been so ashamed in all my life, especially after everything my parents had done for me. It took some time, but they eventually forgave me, and we moved to a small town out in the countryside so I could start at a new school. I never wanted to see those rich kids again. Now, I'm working hard to finish school and save enough money for college, and I've realized that being rich didn't even make me happy. My family might be poor, but they're the nicest people I've ever met, and you can't buy that in any designer shop. All we can do now is pray the doctor said as he left the room. I looked at Ethan lying on the hospital bed, surrounded by medical equipment, and felt my heart sink. Then Elliot came over to me and said, Charles, I think you should maybe go home and rest. There's nothing you can do right now. Yeah, Elliot was right. Now I had to be stronger than ever, and in fact, if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have made it through this crazy time. Although Elliot was a newbie in our department, we'd become close very quickly, and I was so grateful for her. I smiled at Elliot and offered to drive her home, and then I went to see my mate Cooper. He'd just got back from living abroad. We'd been friends for years. We first met at a gay pride party. He was bisexual and I was gay. At least, I had been. But now, I wasn't so sure. You see, I realized that every time I was with Elliot, my heart was beating faster than usual. Could it be that? I got so lost in my thoughts, I didn't even see Cooper opening the door. He looked at me and said, Dude. What's wrong with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. I told him I was in deep trouble and really needed his advice. Lying on his couch, I explained how my boyfriend Ethan was in hospital, but that I'd started having feelings for a girl. Cooper looked at me with sympathy in his eyes, but then he just nudged me and said, 
Charles, welcome to my life. It's okay to have feelings for both men and women. It's normal. I asked him what I should do, and he said I should just listen to my heart and let it decide. And then he winked at me and asked to see a photo of this girl who was turning me by. I opened my phone and showed him, and he looked shocked. His eyes went wide, and I asked him if he thought she was hot too. But then he said something that made my blood run cold. She's my ex-girlfriend, bro. Whoa, what? This couldn't be happening. Then Cooper told me how they used to date and had even set a wedding date. But then something had happened and they'd broken up. This was too weird. What were the chances? I wanted to ask him more about what she was like and why they broke up. But from the look on his face, it was too painful to speak about. Plus, it also made me feel a bit uncomfortable. I could barely sleep that night. Worrying about Ethan and thinking about Elliot and Cooper. It was all so strange. The next day, when I was concentrating on my work, my manager suddenly came over and said, Charles, congrats. You're doing so well. I didn't expect one of your team members that you managed to get promoted so quickly. Huh? What was he talking about? No one had been promoted. I was so confused. He noticed how puzzled I looked and said, Didn't you know? Elliot took over Ethan's role as director. What? How did this happen? I looked at him in surprise and he continued. Word on the street is that Elliot is the president's daughter, so it's normal for her to take over. She clearly hid her identity well, didn't she? Then he just laughed and walked off. Wait, if Elliot was the president's daughter, that meant that she was related to Ethan. She was Ethan's sister, right? Oh, this couldn't be. She'd acted like she didn't even know him at the hospital that day. I quickly ran to find her and said, Hey, Elliot, why didn't you tell me you were Ethan's sister? You know that me and your brother are in love. Why would you hide this from me? Elliot just sighed and said, Well, actually, I didn't want to hide this from you. But my parents sent me to help Ethan to run the company. I don't have any experience, so I wanted everyone to treat me like a normal newbie so I could actually learn. That's why I hid my identity. I'm so sorry. I guess she'd done the right thing, as I'd heard lots of gossip behind my back when I'd started dating Ethan. So I sympathized with her. But now it all made sense. The reason I had a crush on Elliot. She looked so similar to Ethan. The same deep blue eyes, the same cheekbones, even the same gestures. She also had the same shrimp allergy, and they both had this pen-spinning habit when they're deep in thoughts. How had I not noticed this before? What if I wasn't in love with Elliot? I was just in love with how she was so similar to Ethan. Okay, that made me feel a lot better. So it was Ethan I loved after all. The next day I went to visit Ethan with a huge bouquet of sunflowers, his favorite. When I was walking through the entrance, I spotted Cooper. Hey, we meet again, I called out. What are you doing here? He told me how he was visiting his ex who'd been in an accident, and I said I was visiting my boyfriend who'd been in an accident. Let's walk together, I said. What room's your ex in? 1502, Cooper said. Are you sure? I mean, that was Ethan's room, I thought. Then it hit me. Hang on, is your ex called Ethan? I asked, really hoping it wasn't. How did you know that? Cooper said. Because Ethan is my boyfriend, I said. This was way too awkward. How was it possible to have this many coincidences? I couldn't believe it. Cooper was shocked too, and said that Ethan was the reason he and Elliot had broken up. He'd fallen in love with Ethan. And Ethan's family had been so upset by this, they kicked Ethan out of the house. Oh, so that's why Ethan never talked to his family and told me to never ask about them. After that mess, unfortunately, their relationship didn't work out. So Cooper packed up his stuff and decided to go study abroad to start things fresh. Oh man, this was a lot to digest. I couldn't help but wonder how Elliot had felt when she'd found out her husband-to-be was in love with her brother. Cooper and I were so shocked, but not as shocked as we were going to be a moment later. We were about to walk into Ethan's room when we heard Elliot's voice. She was speaking in a mean tone, saying, Ethan, you just wait. How will you feel when your boyfriend falls in love with me? It'll be painful, right? I'll make him leave you and it'll serve you right, after everything you've done to me. It's time for a taste of your own medicine. I froze when I heard her saying that. I turned to Cooper and he was just as shocked as I was. Suddenly he burst through the door and I stormed in after him. Elliot almost fell off her chair in surprise at seeing us. Um, why, why are you two here together? She said. Hey, stranger, Cooper said. Come on, Elliot, give it up already. It's been a long time. Things were over between us. Just let go and move on. Cooper was so angry, but Elliot just laughed and said, Get over yourself, Cooper. It's not about you. I don't have feelings for you anymore. I just want revenge on my brother. It was so cruel of him to steal you away and ruin my life like that. 
Then with eyes full of hatred, she turned and looked at poor Ethan lying there. I was furious. I realized exactly what Elliot had been doing. Deliberately flirting with me to steal me away from Ethan. How could she? I confronted her on the spot. What's wrong with you? Why would you treat me like this? And your poor brother? I didn't expect... Before I could continue, though, she interrupted me and said, Charles, wait, listen to me, please. It's true that that was my intention at first, but then I, I fell in love with you. And I thought you were starting to fall for me, too. Uh, I'm so sorry. Elliot then tried to reach for my hand, but I was disgusted. I pushed her away and said, Get away from me. I don't want to see you anymore. Elliot started crying, but I was too upset to be bothered. I was just so horrified that she'd do this. I was so disappointed in myself, too, for falling into her trap. Poor Ethan. He didn't deserve any of this. I stared at him lying there on the hospital bed. What if he knew? I kept staring at him and swear I saw his fingers twitch. Oh my gosh, was he waking up? Cooper quickly went to the doctor while I stayed with Ethan and tried to talk to him. Ethan, Ethan, are you awake? The doctors ran a few tests and said that Ethan had finally regained consciousness and would wake up properly soon. Cooper and I were over the moon. I was so relieved he was going to be okay. And it seemed like Elliot also felt the same as she stood quietly in a corner of the room, tears streaming down her eyes to the corner of her mouth that turned up in the most subtle smile. And as expected, about a week later, Ethan opened his eyes. I'd never been so happy in my life. He started physical therapy, and I spent a lot of time helping him. Of course, Cooper popped in to visit too, and we all had a good laugh about how connected we all were. This must have been real fate, because calling this coincidence would be an understatement. As for Elliot, she just disappeared. But then a few days later, when Ethan, Cooper, and I were chatting together in the hospital, an email popped up on my phone. It was Elliot, and she said she was so sorry for what she'd done, and she just hoped that Ethan and I could forgive her. Then she said she wished us only happiness. I told Ethan and Cooper the good news, and we were all so relieved. Maybe we could all be friends after all. I mean, Elliot might become my sister-in-law one day, right? Life can be so funny. I'm just so glad Cooper appeared when he did, and everything came out into the open. I'd never forgive myself if I'd left Ethan for his sister. Ethan was always the one for me. It was March 31st. A normal day, right? Well, yeah, but not tomorrow. Nope. As it was April Fool's Day. A prankster like me waits all year for that one day when I can play jokes on people without them getting in a mood with me. I've been planning my tricks for months, and boy oh boy, it's going to be so much fun. <laughs> I turned to my best friend Aya and said with a devious smile, Just you wait until tomorrow. My prank ideas are going to be legendary. I thought Aya would want to know more, but nope. She just blew her fringe out of her face, then sighed out, Floor, why don't you just give it a rest this year? Reality check, no one finds your pranks funny. Only uncomfortable and annoying. What? No way! That's not true. People love my pranks. Aya continued, Do you remember your pencil prank on Luna last year? I nodded and let out a snort. How could I forget that prank, as it had been so funny? I'd cut Luna's pencil in half, filled her pencil grip with ink, then assembled it back together just like new. And voila! Cue an ink explosion during an otherwise boring test. Luna cried a lot because she failed her biology test and had to retake it. I shrugged. So this was technically true, but it was still funny. And the time you swapped the cheerleading team's chant music for heavy metal and made a fool out of them at the basketball match? She frowned at me. Jeez, stop being a fun killer. I'm making everyone's high school experience memorable. As, let's face it, no one will remember boring tests and tedious basketball matches otherwise. I was too busy talking to notice the ball whizzing through the air until it whacked me right on the head. Ouch! The world went black and I collapsed. I opened my eyes to see Aya and some other kids gawping down at me. Then my teacher rushed over and shooed them off. Fleur, are you okay? Her and Aya helped me sit up, and while I rubbed my head, I replied, Yeah, I'm fine, but I do feel a little dizzy. The teacher thought it would be best if I went home early, so she told Aya to take me back. I was so tired. 
but I knew sleeping when I might have a concussion was a bad idea. So I chilled out and watched a movie in my room, until mom came home from work. Okay, so my head hurt, and the room was still spinning, but there was no way I was going to let this small accident ruin my big day. I had planning to do, so I grabbed my notebook and checked through my prank ideas and prop list. The next morning, I woke up bright and early, and yay, the spinning had stopped. Whoa, today was the day. Let the pranking commence. I told Aya to meet me earlier, so I had time to set up my pranks. But to my annoyance, she showed up at the usual time. I hurried over to her and tapped my watch. What time do you call this? Now I'm going to be behind schedule. She gave me a puzzled look. For what? It's not April 1st anymore. Today is the 2nd. You had yesterday off because of your head bump, remember? What? What are you talking about? Look, it says today is April 1st. I waved my phone in her face. Then your calendar is wrong. Check your settings or something. Now, let's go. She walked off. No way. Don't think you can fool me, I said while trying to run after her. As soon as I arrived at school, I joined my friends in the canteen for breakfast, and Kelly looked at me and said, How's the head? I told her it was fine and passed her an Oreo. You know what? She ate it with no hesitation, but after one bite, she spat it into her hand. Ew, what is that? Yuck! I laughed at her and said, Ha! That's toothpaste sandwiched between Oreo biscuits. Okay, I'm sorry. Drink this. Then I passed her a bottle of cola. She took a big gulp, then immediately spit it out. Hey, this is so gross. Then she ran to the bathroom to clean her mouth. Yep, I put soy sauce in that bottle. <laughs> I followed her to the bathroom to check on her and found her rinsing her mouth out under the tap. When she finished, she frowned at me and said, Fleur, this isn't funny. I thought you only did these stupid pranks on April 1st. Now I have to put up with my stinky soy sauce breath all day. I rolled my eyes then smirked. Yeah, as if it's not April 1st today. It's not. What's wrong with you? It's the second. Then she stormed off. Wait, what? What did she mean it was the second? No way. Anyways... Seeing as I was already in there, I decided I may as well carry out another prank. I pulled out my Nutella jar and went into one of the cubicles and waited until another girl went into the one next door. I asked her, Hey, excuse me, my friend, do you have toilet paper in there? She was nice and replied, Sure. Then she passed it to me. I quickly put some Nutella on my hand, then rubbed it over her hand too. Oops. Oh boy. She screamed so loudly, and I couldn't hold my laugh. Ew, what the hell? So disgusting, you freak. Then she ran out to wash her hand. I stepped out. Relax, girl. It was just a prank for Fool's Day. Just Nutella. But she sneered back. You're crazy, and it's the second already. Jeez, what's wrong with you? Then she left. Okay. This was so weird. Why was everyone acting like it was April 2nd? On the way to class, I rechecked my phone. Yep, it said April 1st. Okay, I got it. This was everyone's dumb attempt to fool me. Well, nice try, but it so wasn't working. As it was the first, which meant it was time for math class. I took my seat in class and waited, but... Huh? Why did Mr. Simmons, the chemistry teacher, walk in? He told us to prepare for our next lesson in the lab. Huh? What was going on? I was so confused. That was tomorrow's schedule. Right? Then he sat down in the chair without any suspicion and... <laughs> a big fart sound came. I laughed so much my sides hurt. I couldn't believe it. I do this every year, but they fall for it each time. But hang on, why was everyone so quiet? I looked around and realized I was the only one laughing. Oh, come on, everybody. It was fun. The typical joke for April Fools. Mr. Simons held up the fart pillow and gave me a stern look. Fleur, I don't expect this behavior from someone your age, especially seeing as it's not even April Fool's Day anymore. 
And can you believe it? All my classmates agreed with him. No way! Everyone was crazy. No, it is. I know it is. You're all lying. I replied in a panic before I gathered up my stuff and ran out of the classroom. I really needed some space to think this through. It was all so crazy. I couldn't have zoned out for an entire day. Could I? Or the ball hit me so hard that I lost my memory? I remember having dinner, then staying up late to plan out my pranks, and I know I was tired, but no way. They were the crazy ones, not me. Anyway, lab time. I was the last one to walk in, and I sat down at my bench and started on the experiment. I guess I wasn't focusing properly, as I poured the chemical into the beaker, and boom! The next thing I knew, I was covered in this weird green powder stuff. Still, no one was laughing. Instead, they were all staring at me and asking if I was okay. Then Mr. Simons asked them all, Why is this chemical bottle here? What a mistake! Embarrassed, I ran to the bathroom to clean my face. Jeez, I looked like the Grinch. It was super tricky to scrub off. Ugh, I hoped I wouldn't be stuck with this color forever. But was it someone's prank on me? But if that's the case, then why did no one laugh? I sure would have laughed at me if I was them. Finally, the green powder started to come off. And then I went back to class. On top of my backpack was a folded up note with my name on it. Huh. I opened it. Hi, Fleur. There's something important I want to tell you. Meet me in the hall after class. Devin. X. My heart instantly fluttered. I'd had a crush on Devin for, like, forever. But... Oh... I got this. This had to be a prank. Everybody knew I liked him, so they did all of this to embarrass me. Devin must be involved this time. I glanced over at him, and he smiled, then gave me this cute wave. Whatever, this was definitely too good to be true. Enough. I wasn't going to let everyone laugh at me anymore. So, as I followed Devin to the hall, I took a sip of water, but I kept it in my mouth. Then, when Devin stopped walking and turned to face me, I squirted the water up into the air like an elephant, then said, Ha! Gotcha! I'm no fool! He wiped his face onto the back of his sleeve, then looked me straight in the eye and said, Floor, I have feelings for you. I waited until today to tell you, as I didn't want to do it yesterday on April Fool's Day as you'd probably think it was a joke. So why do that to me? I stared at him speechless. The highlighted words that I'd heard were, feelings, yesterday, and April Fool's Day. I started laughing a fake laugh, but then it turned awkward, because his serious expression didn't budge. You're kidding, right? I muttered out, but he looked totally devastated. Oh no, I didn't want to upset Devin. I was just confused with days and, ugh, as if I actually missed April Fool's Day. What a bummer. I realized my prank had gone too far and how it could have hurt his feelings, so I blurted out, Devin, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. It's the concussion. I, I'm delirious. I'm so sorry. Then came an awkward silence. Suddenly, Devin's sad look changed into a smirk and he began to laugh. Then everyone jumped out of nowhere and started laughing too. I stood there with a gormless expression on my face. Then Aya appeared and said, Gotcha! So it turns out it was actually April the 1st, and I hadn't actually missed a day. Nope, this was Aya's ingenious idea for everyone to get their own back on me. Last night, she created a group on Facebook and added everyone in the class including the teachers, to plan today's prank. No, this couldn't be possible. I was the pranking queen, not them. Then Aya sidled up to me and said, Hey, Fleur, guess what? It's still April Fool's Day. The next thing I knew, I was grinning at her. Then I play hit her arm and started to laugh. I guess that they had fooled me good. After that, I didn't carry out any more pranks. I was just happy to have a chilled rest of the day. Then, when I was walking home, Devin caught up with me and said, Floor, I'm sorry. Um, but actually, not everything was a joke today. I smiled and looked at him. 
Oh, yeah? So what's not a joke? But he just turned tomato red, then rushed away. I stood there blushing as I watched him hurry off. Did this mean Devin really likes me? Hmm, interesting. Maybe this April Fool's Day wasn't such a fail after all. Hey, that guy over there just asked for your info, the bartender said, which made me turn and look around. Oh, he's gone. As you can see, I'm sitting at the bar of a five-star resort. No, I'm not rich. Instead, I took out all my savings and decided to splurge them on enjoying every single last day left of my life. It all started months ago. I had this constant aching and exhaustion. I blamed work stress, but my symptoms grew worse. Eventually, I went to the doctor and sat there in stunned shock as I heard the words cancer and progressive. The next few weeks were a whirlwind of hospital appointments and treatments. I had chemo, and my lovely long hair fell out. I just felt tired and hopeless all of the time. Enough had I had this. I stopped the chemotherapy, quit my job, and decided to enjoy the little time I had left. The Hawaiian beach is so beautiful. Then suddenly, someone walked straight into me. Ugh, their drink soaked me. I heard them say, Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Oh, hey, you're the girl who sat alone at the bar earlier. I looked up, and wow, he was handsome. I shook my head and insisted it was my fault for not paying attention. After that, he joined me for a walk, and we started chatting. Oh, his name is Blake, by the way. So the next day, I asked him out for lunch. I don't have much of an appetite these days, and the most I could do was staring down at my barely touched plate. Then I knew I needed to be honest with him. Hey, Blake, I really like you and want to get to know you more, but I have cancer and don't have long left. At first there was a sickening silence, but then he took my hand, and can you believe it? He said he wanted to get to know me too. The next few weeks with him were magical. Then we came back to the city and continued dating. Blake was so amazing and constantly showered me with love. One night after dinner, Blake drove us up to this hill. He said he wanted to show me Orion's belt, and it was so romantic. I didn't want to ruin the moment, but there was something I needed to tell him. Blake, I saw the doctor today. He said that nothing has changed. Although he didn't mention it, I guess I don't really have much time left. My tears streamed down my face. I've had the best time with you. I really do think I love you. Suddenly, Blake got down on one knee and asked me, My darling Lucy, will you marry me? This is the least I can do for you. I was speechless so I nodded and then held him tightly in my arms. I was too happy. I couldn't help sharing our love story on social media. Soon, thousands of people were liking and sharing it, saying what an inspirational couple we were. This was crazy, but amazing. Their support made me feel like I could take on my cancer, the world, everything. I started noticing that Blake was getting a lot of attention from other girls. They knew he was the guy who proposed to the dying girl, so they seemed to flock around him and admire him. Then one day, when we were at the wedding dress store together, I stepped out of the fitting room in this beautiful gown, feeling like a princess. But then I spotted Blake talking to some other girl. She touched his shoulder, and I overheard her say, "'Your fiancé is very lucky to have you.' Then she leaned in closer to him, Blake? I hissed at him. Baby, how do I look? He turned away from the girl and stared at me. Yeah, gorgeous, he awkwardly smiled. I couldn't help but feel terrible. I know he's an attractive man, but he was about to marry me. It was not nice at all having him flirt with someone else at my dress fitting. 
Still, I tried to put it all aside, as I wanted to enjoy what little time I had left. The wedding was a dream come true. It was such a magical day. Then right before our honeymoon, I went to see my doctor. To my complete and utter shock, he told me, I'm pleased to inform you that you're in recovery. Oh my god. I couldn't believe my ears. I was getting better? I rushed home and told Blake the good news. Only his reaction wasn't what I expected. His face dropped, and at first he was speechless. Then he stuttered, Congrats, honey. Hmm. What did that even mean? Regardless of this, our honeymoon was marvelous. My appetite was back, and I was making the most of it. Yum! Food tastes so good. This didn't go unnoticed by Blake, and he tutted, Can you try chewing more gently? Whatever. I was intent on enjoying my food. When we arrived back home, I moved into his apartment. For God's sake, there were dirty plates and smelly socks everywhere. How could someone so meticulous about their looks live in such a state? I told myself that it was fine. I loved him, so I could learn to love his mess. <sighs> Being alive felt so good. So admittedly, I may have overdone it on the snacks. Cake, meals out, and yeah. I'd gained some extra pounds, so household chores were a bit too much for me. Besides, why should I have to do them? It was his mess. But one time, when I was sick of his stinky underpants everywhere, I asked him, How can a guy who looks like you live in this rat hole? Go clean up. But he ignored me and went straight to bed. And it took no time for his loud thunder snores to follow. What the hell? Where was the kind, charming man I married? Fed up, I tried my best to clean up the place a little bit. I was out of breath and sweating a lot. My head was super itchy, so I took off my wig and scratched my scalp. At that moment, I heard Blake screaming, and when I turned around, he was clutching his face in fear. Baby, what's wrong? I rushed to him. Oh, I got it. I laughed out. It was just too uncomfortable to wear this wig, so I took it off. That's all? But look, my hair is growing back again. Shaking, he stuttered. Y y you were wearing a wig this whole time? You look terrifying. Well, yeah, I suppose jagged growing hair made me look quite creepy. <laughs> Shouldn't you be happy for me? I mumbled and forced a smile, while trying to put the wig back on. Knowing that I was able to live life again was incredible. But living Blake with my moody, uncaring husband, now that wasn't so great. One evening, he came home from work in a foul mood and started shouting at me for not tidying up. I told him I shouldn't have to, as it wasn't my mess. He scowled at me. I single-handedly provide for the both of us. Come home to see you chilling on your huge backside, and you dare talk to me like that? You're the one who needs to get up and work, since you eat double the amount I do. His words hurt, so with teared-up eyes, I said to him, How dare you talk to me like that? Blake was about to say something, but he paused, then just sighed. Look, I'm sorry, babe. I know you're recovering. I sharply stared at him and said, I didn't do anything for dinner, so let's eat out. I was enjoying my rotary chicken. It was so good that I might have taken too big of a bite and it lodged in my throat. Soon I was choking. I couldn't breathe. Afraid, I looked at Blake for help, but he was scrolling through his phone. And to my disbelief, he walked off to the bathroom. I kept thudding the table to call for help, Luckily, a waiter rushed over and hit me real hard on the back, and I managed to spit the piece of chicken out. When Blake returned, I angrily asked, How the hell could you leave me like that? What are you talking about, baby? I saw you enjoying your food. Are you done? Let's go home. Ugh! He definitely knew I was choking. What a jerk. Everything I once thought and expected from him shattered. He was willing to let me choke to death over helping me. The problem was our love story was so famous now, and even though I knew Blake and I couldn't bear each other, the thought of us breaking up and being heckled by others made me feel so sick. 
I guess I was stuck with him forever. So we had to continue tolerating each other. Then one evening, while I was munching on potato chips and watching TV, my phone rang. It was a strange number. Hello? Are you Blake's wife? Blake's been in a car accident, and we really need you to come here. I froze for a few seconds. Sorry, wrong number, and hung up. My phone rang several more times, but I didn't answer. The guilt started to creep up on me, so I grabbed my bag and rushed to the hospital. The nurse told me to sign some papers so Blake could have his surgery. With a pen in hand, I hesitated. Excuse me, where is the organ donating section? I asked. My husband is willing to donate if anything bad happens. This is not the right time to ask me that question, the nurse yelled at me. Right at that moment, Blake's parents rushed in panicking. I gave them the papers and sneaked back to the apartment. After that, I thought long and hard about our relationship. It had been so passionate at first, but I realized I didn't love him at all, and neither did he. All our decisions were made intensely quickly, based on the idea that I might die later. We were too stubborn to admit defeat and walk away, and now we were miserable. A few weeks later, Blake came home in a wheelchair, and we both sat in awkward silence. Then I broke the ice. That night, when I choked at the restaurant, did you ignore me on purpose? Blake answered me with another question. Is it true you wanted to donate my organs instead of helping me get my surgery? I replied, I'm sorry. That was the only way I could briefly think of to get out of this marriage. He sighed. I know. Me too. I think we're just too similar, and that's why we don't work. He paused. I think it's time we put an end to this. So finally, we stopped putting up with each other and filed for a divorce. People on social media were furious and posted a lot of venomous comments, such as, so much for being an inspirational couple, and this screams out scam marriage to me. I decided to close all of my online accounts. Their opinions don't matter anymore. I have my family's support. That's more important. Surprisingly, I'm still friends with Blake. Hey, we went through a lot together, and he's not all bad. I just never want to live with him ever again. <laughs> I even met my current boyfriend through Blake, as he introduced me to him. How funny is that? Sometimes things don't work out as planned, but that's okay. Living a lie just to save a bruised ego is much worse. Oh, by the way, this is my real hair. I am now completely healthy. Remember, you only live once. So, make sure you don't waste your time trying to please others. And instead, you embrace life and live it at its best. I opened the drawer and, aha, uh -huh, there it was. I'd been looking for this magazine for ages. But as I closed the drawer, I noticed something else. A photo hiding under the magazine. There was a woman and two kids in the photo. A boy and a girl. I was so confused. Hmm, who were they? I turned it over and there was a message on the back that said, This is my new number. Call me more often. I miss you so much. Suddenly my mom came in and I was about to ask her about the photo, but she got mad and started screaming at me to get out of the room. Never, ever come into our room again. Do you hear me, Erin? We have private stuff in here. You know the rules. I, I was just looking for the magazine, I said, and quickly tucked the photo inside before running out of her room. Actually... I knew I wasn't meant to go in my parents' room, but I was doing a school essay on sustainability and I'd seen an article in my mom's magazine about it a few days back. So I'd search the whole house to try and find it. Eventually, I knew the only place it could be was their room. So I snuck in. Usually their door was locked, so I was in luck. Ever since I was a kid, I had been forbidden to go in there, but I had no idea why. Back in my room, I couldn't stop staring at the photo. Were these my relatives or something? Long-lost cousins? The boy in the pic looked totally like my dad. 
Oh, no. Reading the note behind it again, suddenly I thought this could be another family of my dad. Do you know what I meant? Yes. What if my dad had a secret family? Maybe he'd cheated on my mom and had this whole other secret life. My inner detective was going crazy. There was nothing else for it. I had to get to the bottom of this and find out the truth. I searched online for the phone number and couldn't believe it when a girl the same age as me popped up. I started scrolling through all her photos and suddenly saw one of a young guy holding a baby and the caption said, Miss the old days of being daddy's little girl. This was insane. I was certain the young guy in the photo was my dad and I needed to talk to the girl ASAP. I messaged her and told her we were related. I even sent some photos of me taken with my dad to prove it. I was shaking when I saw her reply pop up. My dad never mentioned you. Not even once. That hurt me so much. I couldn't believe this girl was actually my dad's daughter too. Now, how am I supposed to break this news to mom? She'd freak out. I couldn't bear the thought of seeing this crush her. So, I decided to go clear things up myself first. A few days later, my dad was going on a business trip to Boston. Again. He was always going to Boston. I'd always believed he was just super busy at work. But now I knew the truth as my dad's secret daughter had confirmed she was also from Boston. I mean, of course she was. So, I told my mom I was going to spend the weekend at my friend's house. And the moment my dad left, I jumped in a cab that I'd called and asked the driver to follow him. When we got to Boston, I saw my dad stop outside of a house and then glance around as if he thought he was about to get caught. Then he got out of his car and rang the doorbell. A woman came to open and immediately they started kissing. Then a young girl appeared and, yep, it was exactly the people in the photo. I was shaking so much, I actually dropped the money for the cab. It felt like my dad had punched me in the chest. I was so upset. He had this whole other family that mom and I had no clue about. I couldn't stand it anymore. Mom didn't deserve this. I walked towards the house and was so focused on what I was planning to say to my dad, I didn't even notice a van pulling up right next to me. Suddenly, everything went black, and I realized I had been blindfolded. A huge hand was covering my mouth so I couldn't even scream. I felt tape being put across my lips, sealing them shut. Then someone yanked me backwards and shoved me into some kind of car. Oh my god. Was I being kidnapped? Why? Had my dad seen me and now he was trying to cover his tracks? This was like something out of a movie. They even tied me up. After what felt like a billion hours, we finally stopped and I was dragged out of the car into a cold, dark building. Someone took my blindfold off, but it was so dark inside I couldn't really see anything except a single light bulb above my head. The tape across my mouth was pulled off and I was untied. I wanted to run out of there as fast as possible, but I was terrified. Two men dressed in black were standing in the room and one of them glared at me and said, They think they can hide you forever? <laughs> Who are you? I shouted. Where am I? If it's money you want, call my dad. Please, just let me go, I said, in what must have been the shakiest voice ever. Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. We don't even need money. It's your parents we want. In three weeks, they'll be out of prison. And then they'll need to come here to get you back. Then we can really punish you for knowing too many secrets about us. I had no idea what they were talking about. Prison? My parents aren't in prison. You've got the wrong person. One of the men just laughed and said, It's been 12 years, and yet you still don't know about it. Then he walked off laughing his head off. What? What were they talking about? None of this made any sense. My dad was a businessman, and my mom was a housewife. This was all some big mix-up. It had to be. They'd locked me in that dark room. I tried to scream and bang on the door, but no one heard me. Or if they did, they didn't care. The next few days were some of the worst of my life. I didn't think I'd survive. Twice a day someone slipped food under the door, and I spent most of the time trying to think of ways to escape. There was no window, 
but there was a small air vent, and if I could just open it, I thought I might be able to crawl through and get the heck out of this disgusting, shabby place. Lucky for me, they'd given me a fork to eat with, and slowly I'd been using it to loosen the screws on the grid of the vent. Finally, on the third night, I waited until everything was dead quiet, and I got into the vent. I crawled through and managed to get out. I was at the back of some old abandoned warehouse, and as I stood up to stretch my legs, someone covered my mouth from behind. Oh no! How had I got caught so quickly? But then I heard a voice. Shh, are you okay? I almost screamed. It was my mom. How did you find me? I asked. But she just grabbed my hand and said, Let's get out of here. Then I'll explain. We climbed through a small gap in the fence, and then I saw a black car by the road. I started to panic again, but my mom told me it was for us. And then as we climbed in, she said to the driver, I got her, James. Let's go. It was only then that I finally took a look at my mom and realized what she was wearing. She was in all black and looked like a spy or something. Um, mom, what's going on? My mom bit her lip and said she couldn't hide it from me anymore. What she told me next was unbelievable. Turns out my parents weren't even my real parents. My biological mom and dad used to be members of this mob, but 12 years ago they'd been given an impossible task and they refused to do it, so their boss said he'd harm me as their punishment. My parents had no choice but to turn themselves in and ask the police for protection for me. In return, they gave the police some confidential info about the mob. Whoa, I was shocked. So, you're not my mom? My real parents are in prison? I felt like my head was spinning. How could my life get so crazy? Yep, they're in prison. Back then, the police stormed into the mob's headquarters, but the boss had managed to escape. That's why we put you in the protection program, because we knew he'd come search for you. This was too much! I didn't want such a dramatic life! Then I suddenly remembered there was more drama. Mom, um, I found out Dad was cheating on you, so I followed him here to Boston. Did you follow him too? I mean, how did you find me? This was so weird. My mom didn't look sad at all. She said, actually, he wasn't cheating. That woman and those kids are his family. You see, at the time, he and I were the only two people qualified enough to adopt you. So he actually left his family to fake our family life to protect you. It was all part of the protection program, but he missed his family so much. That's why he went back to see them most weekends. I'm so sorry, Aaron. We didn't expect it to turn out like this. When you didn't come home on Sunday, I used the GPS we set on your phone, and that's how I found you. Okay, my head was spinning even more. Not only were they not my real parents, they weren't even a real couple. This was absolute insanity, and all to protect me? Wow. And as it turns out, it worked out pretty well, because by tracking me, they found the new boss's hideout, and now the police had arrived and he was finally being arrested. As for me and my family, we had to pretend to be a real family, for now. And actually, it wasn't that hard, because I loved them so much, and they'd sacrificed the past 12 years of their life to protect me. I'd be eternally grateful to them, and my biological parents would be out of prison soon, and then I'd be reunited with them. I don't remember anything about them, but they also sacrificed their lives to protect me, so they must be pretty amazing, right? Oops, still not it. Wow, why do they have an entire room just for shoes? That's mental. I muttered to myself as I closed the door. I swear, that was like the 20th door I'd opened. This place was insane. I had no idea which door would lead to my bedroom. To be honest, I've never been anywhere this lavish before in my entire life. Okay, it's now down to this door or that one over there. Wish me luck. But as I reached for the doorknob, I heard a voice. Hey, what prank you trying to pull on me again? I caught you red-handed this time, Gabby. Startled, I turned around and... Oh, wow. There was this super cute guy standing there, looking so smug with himself. So this must be Jaden, the annoying big brother that Gabby had told me about. Only he didn't seem annoying to me. But right, I needed to stay in character, so I replied, Um, yeah, guess I was just too busy thinking about stuff that I didn't watch where I was going. Take it easy, bro. Then I immediately fled to the other room while Jaden watched me in confusion. Phew! 
That was a close one. And, wow, was Gabby a princess or something? She lived in a literal palace. Look at her room. Oh, you must be wondering. Yes, I'm not Gabby. I'm Nancy. So how come Jaden didn't realize that I was not his sister? Now, let me tell you, that's one wild story. I was just a normal teenager, living my peaceful life in the Missouri countryside. My family doesn't have a lot of money, so I worked part-time in a nearby diner, so I could save up for college. Yeah, it wasn't perfect, but I knew I was lucky to have my loving family. They're my everything. So, anyway, it wasn't uncommon for schools from St. Louis to arrange trips out here, to show the kids what country life was like. And on days like those, the diner could get pretty hectic, and today was no exception. By the time my shift finished, I was a tired, sweaty mess, so I took the scenic route home to unwind. That's when I heard this girl screaming for help. She must have slipped and fell into this ditch. I quickly found a big branch to help pull her out of there. Then she brushed the dirt off her as she said, Thanks. But as she looked up at me, OMG! We both jumped up in such a fright that we almost stumbled back into the ditch. She looked exactly like me. I pinched myself to check I wasn't hallucinating or something. I mean, I was super exhausted from work. We stared at each other gormlessly for a bit. Then she suddenly reached out her hand and slapped me. Ouch! I raised my eyebrows at her, and she just grinned back. Oops, sorry. Just checking this isn't a dream. That's when I saw it. Her bracelet. The pendant on it was a strange shape. A strange shape like mine. I held up my wrist to slot my bracelet's pendant into hers, and it formed a butterfly. What's more, carved on the back of it was our birthday, November 3rd. Oh my god, no wonder why. I always asked my parents why they bought me such an ugly bracelet. Turns out it was two halves of a hole? She shrieked. So, do you think we're... twins? I was still in shock, but I managed to mutter out, Must be. She excitedly clapped her hands together, then pulled me into a hug. She said her name was Gabby, and her field trip was so dull that she wandered off, then ended up lost and stuck. Then I told her about my loving family, and she told me about her city life. I thought her life sounded awesome, but she didn't think so. Nah, it's seriously so boring over there. I just want a happy, drama-free life like yours. It makes sense now. I see why my parents love my brother more than me. I'm obviously adopted. But hey, at least you have your friends and get to go to a good school. School? That's the worst part. I hate it. Then she paused and turned to me. Nancy, I have an amazing idea. How about we switch places? This was crazy. An hour ago, I thought I was an only child, and now I was staring at my twin. Gabby seemed adamant switching places was the best idea ever, as I'd get a taste of the city life while also helping her ace her upcoming exams. This did sound tempting. I mean, it wasn't every day your long-lost twin appeared and offered you the adventure of a lifetime, right? We didn't have much time to discuss it anymore, so we quickly switched clothes, phones, and further instructions about anything else would be discussed later over the phone. Then, I showed her the way to my house, and I headed toward the crowd of noisy students lining up for the bus back to the city. Suddenly, a girl tapped me on the shoulder, and in an annoyed tone said, Er, uh, where have you been? Blonde hair, a pink hairband, and wearing a choker with a heart pendant on it? Yep, this must be Katie, Gabby's best friend. I followed her onto the bus, then yawned and told her I was exhausted. I feigned sleeping for the duration of the journey back so she wouldn't start any more convos with me. So after that, things went by smoothly, until I got home and didn't know where I normally sleep at. But it's okay now, as I'm safe in Gabby's bedroom. The butler did knock on the door to ask me to come down for dinner. I know, the fact they have a butler is crazy but I just lied that I'd eaten loads on the field trip. 
There was no time for food now. I needed to learn as much as I could about these people. I searched her room and looked through her yearbooks, family photos, anything. I thought I was ready to go to school as Gabby tomorrow, but, well, as if it was that simple. The next morning, I nervously came downstairs to go to school, and of course, I had to face the entire family now. Upon seeing me, the small talks all came flying at me. How was yesterday's trip, dear? I managed to mumble out, Um, it, it was all right. Then suddenly, a hand rubbed my hair. Hey, I'm taking your PB&J, okay? You won't eat it anyway. I turned to look and saw him grinning at me before he headed outside. Oh gosh, I thought I'd melted into a puddle. He's so cute. I just wanted to follow him, but then Dad cleared his throat. Gabriella, can we please make it a day free of complaints from your teachers? Oh God, Gabby, what had you possibly done? I gulped back, nodded in response, then hurried out of there. I awkwardly lingered in front of the mansion. This was the spot where the bus dropped me off yesterday, so hope this was how it worked. Then suddenly, a scary-looking guy pulled up on the other side of the street and yelled at me. Babe, what are you doing? Get in! Me? I was his babe? Oh, so he was Dylan, my sister's boyfriend. I walked over and reluctantly climbed on the back seat. Hey! What's wrong? Are you still mad at me for letting you go on the field trip alone? Come on, you said it was okay. I didn't know what to say to him, so I stayed quiet and stared out the window. Come on, babe, I mean, this is dumb. We both know how sitting in the back always gives you travel sickness. Gosh, I really needed to say something to shut this guy up, huh? No, it's totally fine between us. Um, it's just that I feel a bit under the weather. I need a little rest, that's all, and it's more spacey here. Well, that seemed to quiet him down, but I kept on catching him giving me odd looks in the rearview mirror. Look at him! Ugh! Gabby and I might be twins, but our tasting guys couldn't be any more different. Dylan looked like the bad boy type. Green hair, a nose ring, and drove some flashy sports car, while I prefer sweet and funny guys, like Jaden but I didn't want to accidentally ruin my sister's relationship either, so when we got to school, I had to give him a peck on the cheek to make sure that we were cool. Yuck, his cologne stank. Luckily, I met Katie in the parking lot, so I followed her to class. Things were going great, at least they were, until we got to Spanish class. The teacher, Mrs. Harrison, gave me this judgy look right from the moment I walked in. Turns out, Gabby hadn't handed in her homework, and she spent the whole of the last session painting her nails. Mrs. Harrison demanded to check my homework today. Well, of course, I didn't know I had homework. So, in a disappointed voice, she said, Gabby, it's been two years and you still don't know how to conjugate any single verb. Are you proud of that? Suddenly, I heard Katie whisper, But at least she knows how to dress, Mrs. Harrison. Your sweater looks like it should have been thrown out two years ago. Then some of the class giggled. Oh my god, Katie? That was so rude. But luckily, the teacher didn't hear that. I quickly apologized to Mrs. Harrison and told her to just give me a pop quiz to make up for my missing homework. She did. And to her, and the whole class's total surprise, I slayed all the questions. After class, I told Katie that her comment about Mrs. Harrison wasn't cool. Laughing, she replied, Jeez, why are you so uptight today? But on seeing my unfaltering expression, she quickly changed the subject. You've still got to help me with the plan, okay? You promised. She winked at me. What? What plan? In confusion, I faked a smile at Katie. Oh, don't you worry, girl. I got it all set. That night, Gabby called me and we updated each other on our first day. Things went better than expected. Apparently, she loved it there, and she felt so warm and connected with mom and dad, and she was sure that they were our real parents. She also enjoyed feeding the chickens and apple picking in the backyard. However, she did almost get me fired from work 
as she didn't know how to use the oven, but she managed to charm her way out of it. I told her how I'd handled the Dylan situation and made peace with Mrs. Harrison. But, oh, Gabby, Katie did mention to me about some plan? What is it? Oh, uh, yeah, I promised to set her up with Jaden. I guess you'll have to carry it out for me now. My heart sank as I said, Jaden? As in, your brother Jaden? Yeah, now not biologically. It's no wonder I just couldn't get along with him. Not like us, right? I forced a laugh and changed the subject. But, oh no, Jaden was far more suited to me than rebellious Katie. But, okay, this was Gabby's life, so I needed to make sure I didn't mess it up. And maybe, when this twinning truth broke out, I'd get my chance with Jaden. For now, we agreed to continue living each other's lives. I suppose it was pretty easy, seeing as all Gabby seemed to do was hang out with her friends and avoid doing her homework. The only part I didn't like was setting Katie up with Jaden. And that's when things got complicated. Will we ever tell everyone the truth? Or this life swap is too much fun to stop? Stay tuned for part two to find out. It was just a regular school day and I was sorting out my locker when suddenly I heard hushed whispers and noticed that everyone else was staring at something. Okay, so turns out it wasn't a something, but a someone. As this pretty girl strutted down the corridor like it was a runway or something. Ugh. Why was everyone golfing at her, rushing over to greet her, and sticking notepads in her face for her to sign? I hugged my books and muttered, Geez, there's nothing special about her. So, my name's Lily, and I'm just a normal girl. My family? Yeah, they're normal. My appearance? Normal. And my social status? Well, that's just normal too. I coast through life, and that's it. Nothing exciting ever happens to a regular girl like me. Oh, how I long to be the perfect looking girls on Instagram. They're so flawless in their clear skin, stylish clothes, and glossy hair. But those girls were different. They were from different worlds. Oh well, at least I still had my books, my bestie Sarah, and my cute boyfriend Brian. But this all changed when Stacy rocked up at school with her perfect looks and her I'm so sweet and friendly routine. Yeah, right. So what if she had a prettyish face and a bit part in some TV show underneath the fake shine she was clearly not all that? I walked into English class to see her sitting at the desk next to mine. Ugh, great. I couldn't even get to my seat because everyone else was surrounding her, asking her dumb questions such as, What shampoo do you use? And do you get snack breaks when you film your show? Jeez, give me a break instead. Then, when I finally managed to sit down, she smiled at me and in this sickly sweet voice said, Hi, I hope it's okay I sit here. I'm Stacy. Yeah, sure. I forced a smile back, but on the inside, my anger was boiling over. Who did this girl think she was? So what if she was beautiful? I bet she only cared about her looks and never bothered studying. Yeah, everyone else would soon realize what a failure she was. Then, one time during recess, Stacy, the living Barbie doll, suggested we start a yearbook and now everyone's treating her like she's achieved world peace or something. Ugh, you know the worst part of it? I've been saying we should start a yearbook for years, but no one listened to me. And guess who received so many welcome cards and love notes that they fell out of her locker and obstructed the hallway? Yup, Stacy. Gosh, it's been like weeks already. When will these stop? I hated how she thanked everyone and blushed and ugh. I needed to be around a sane person who didn't think the sun shone out of her. She was everywhere. It made me sick. But thank God for lunchtime. It became the only peaceful time of the day for me when I could hang out with Sarah and not have to worry about Stacy. But ha, huh, what was this? What was that Barbie doll doing sitting at our table and talking to my best friend? I walked over there and placed my tray down next to Sarah. Oh, hi, Lily. Stacy just said the funniest thing. Great, I muttered under my breath. Lunch was an ordeal. Sarah ignored me and kept on asking Stacy dumb questions like, 
Is your co-star Kyle as handsome in real life? And how do you style printed skirts with a colored tee? Yawn! Later that day, due to a paint spillage in art, I was five minutes laid out. Sarah had agreed to drive me home, but I went out to the parking lot. Her car wasn't there. Then I checked my phone and saw that she'd messaged me. Where are you? I can't wait anymore. I'll leave first with Stacy. See you tomorrow, X. What? Is she ditching me to give that phony a ride? We had been friends since childhood. How could she be fooled for Stacy's act and just throw away our friendship like that? Angry, I messaged her back. You abandoned me for Little Miss Popular? How could you? I get it. New one in, old one out. Well, thanks a lot. My phone buzzed with her reply. Lily, you know it isn't like that. You live up the road from school while Stacy lives much further away and she needed to get back in time to get ready for her filming schedule. Matter than ever, I quickly typed out my reply. Whatever, it's too bad you'll always be a nobody in her eyes and she's just using you for a free ride. Then I chucked my phone onto my bed. I'd had enough. Sarah had made her choice and it was to be friends with that fake over me. Sarah may have fallen into the Stacy trap, but at least I still had Brian, right? One afternoon, I was talking to him out in the schoolyard when Stacy tottered past. Even her try to hard walk was annoying. She smiled over my Brian. Then she deliberately tripped up and dropped the books she was holding. I grabbed Brian's arm to stop him from going over, but he shook himself free from my grip and went over to her anyway. I watched him help her pick her books up, and then she blushed and squeaked out a thank you. She was the worst. When he walked back over to me with this big grin on his face, I couldn't take it anymore. So I blurted out to him, How dare you leave me to help her? He gave me a confused look. Lily, I was just helping her out. Yeah, right. You knew she dropped them on purpose to get your attention. But you went over there to her anyway because you think she's prettier than me. He sighed. You're being ridiculous. You know what? I can't deal with your selfish, jealous streak anymore. Let's just call it a day. We're done. Then he walked off. I stood there watching him, expecting him to cool down and come back. Only he didn't. This was all Stacy's fault. She'd stolen my best friend and my boyfriend. No more. It was time to show her that she wasn't so perfect after all. I scrolled through her social media pages for ideas, and it soon became apparent that she loves boys with toned abs who ride motorbikes. How predictable. I discovered this website where I could hire a boy to play with her heart, then ditch her. It's about time she learned how much it sucked to be undesirable and worthless. Ha! I found the perfect guy called Josh. He was 19, a gym addict, and he had a motorbike. Whoa, he was expensive, but it would be worth it, right? I arranged to meet him at the local coffee shop, and jeez, he was even more handsome in person. I wished I could use this money to actually make him mine. Sigh. So, the deal is, he's gonna flirt with Stacy, make her love him deeply, and then break up with her. The next Monday, I walked out of school to see Josh parked up to the school gate, holding his helmet and looking like he belonged in a movie. Naturally, every girl was staring at him, but he made a beeline for Stacy. Then, just one week later, I saw him picking up Stacy from the school. Whoa, I knew that. I knew I had chosen the right person. Josh was such a lady killer. They looked super close and I had to remind myself that he was just an actor and he was doing his job. <laughs> she was going to be so heartbroken. But a few weeks later and he was still picking her up. Huh? Why hadn't he broken up with her yet? So I called him up and asked him what was taking him so long. He replied that he would do it soon. He was just making her fall for him more before he did it. <laughs> Brutal. Only the weeks passed by and he still hadn't ended it. Then I was walking past the movie theater and I spotted them there, kissing. What? This was not the plan! Furious, I had arranged to meet him the next day at the coffee shop. He walked over and couldn't even meet my eye as he said, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. I will refund you as soon as I can. Um, why? Have you fallen in love with her or something? I said jokingly. There was a long silence. Then he looked down at the table and muttered out, Yeah, I have. Why was I the only one on the planet who saw how thick she was? Thanks to her siren ways, I lost my best friend, my boyfriend, and now my savings. This was it. 
I needed to confront her. The next day at school, I tried finding her, but she was nowhere to be found. Then, as I passed through the school garden, I saw her sitting there. Gotcha. It's time to tell her exactly what I thought of her. I stormed over to her and opened my mouth to speak, but huh? Why was she crying? When she saw me, she managed to smile and said, Oh, hi, Lily. Is there a chance you could help me? I stared at her with disbelief. Did she think I was under her spell and would do her bidding? But then I saw what she was crying about. In her hands was her English essay with a big F on it. So I replied, um, why me? You're so smart. You answer all the questions in class correctly. I don't want to be judged on my bad grades. That's why I left my last school. The other kids call me a brainless beauty. I moved here for a fresh start and now I'm still failing. Okay, so in that moment, I realized that there were things I was good at. My grades were good and I was pretty great at remembering facts. I'd just been so blinded by jealousy that I lost focus on these things and only saw what I didn't have. None of this was Stacy's fault. She never actually done anything bad to me. I'd made it all up in my head because I was jealous of her. So I sat down next to her and said, No one's going to call you that because I'll help you study. You will? She gave me a hopeful smile and I nodded. Thank you so much, she flung her arms around me. So that's how Stacy went from being my enemy to my friend. She's actually a really sweet and kind-hearted girl. No wonder why everyone admired her so much. And I was wrong to judge her on her appearance and not give her a fair chance. She's still with Josh and she doesn't know that I hired him to break her heart. But hey, she now has a hunky boyfriend who adores her, so that could be considered compensation, right? Brian and I are still over, but thinking about it, maybe this was for the best. I know I overreacted, but he gave me up so easily, and well, I want to find a guy who won't do that. As for Sarah, I went around to her house with a bag full of her favorite candy, and I apologized for being a jealous jerk. Luckily for me, she forgave me. Now, Sarah, Stacy, and I have become good friends. Sarah and I both help Stacy with her studies, and she gives us fashion tips. And you know what? I've come to realize that I'm pretty after all. I just needed to discover my spark. So finally, I learned that no one's perfect. Perfection is just an illusion. The most important thing is that we feel happy with what we own and never stop improving ourselves. So just be you and let everyone else concentrate on being them. Scott, I said it's over. You're just too immature for me. He gave me a quizzing look, then said, Huh? What? Babe, we're great together. I rolled my eyes. I just figured I don't need to be with someone with such a childish mentality. I need someone mature and... Whatever, Linda. Find me when you change your mind. He grunted. Then he put his earphones in and walked off. Well, at 15... I needed a guy with a certain maturity, not some loser who still found fart jokes funny. Please. My friends, Patty and Louise, agreed with me. I'm far too popular, pretty, and confident to date just anyone. Anyway, as luck should happen, I was walking along the school corridor when I saw this lost-looking but amazingly handsome guy. Flicking out my hair, I approached him with my friendliest voice. Hey, are you okay? Flustered, he replied, Yes, um, which way is it to the principal's office? I'm going that way anyway, so I'll show you. This was a blatant lie, as my class was in the other direction, but he didn't know that. Later that day, I walked into physics class with Lewis and stopped dead. Standing at the front of the class was that handsome guy. It turns out he was the substitute teacher and written on the board behind him, was the name Mr. Halton. My first name is Colin, by the way, he smiled. I whispered to Lewis, seems like science class has heated up. Then I walked over to my seat. There's no way I could concentrate on the density of materials, not with the hottest teacher ever sharing the same airspace as me. I needed to find a way to get to know him and show him that I wasn't like the other girls my age. Instead, I was far more mature and self-assured than them. So, at the end of class, I walked over and asked him if he'd go over a few things with me. He gladly agreed, so I got to sit down next to him 
and daydreamed in the scent of his musky cologne. Physics class became my favorite. With my head in my hands, I watched him address the class. He saw me looking at him a few times, but he always quickly looked away. It's okay. I got it. He was just trying to look professional. Then, one time, he asked the question, According to Einstein, is light a partial or a wave? I stuck my hand in the air and grinned. He looked a little flustered. Linda? I puckered my lips and looked straight at him. That shirt color really suits you, sir. It brings out your eyes. Some of the other kids in class laughed, and he awkwardly fiddled with his collar. So cute! Then he coughed and said, <coughs> Linda, do you know the answer? Oh, what was the question again? I stared dreamily at him. Honestly, I couldn't remember anything afterwards but his charmingly severe look. Then one afternoon, Colin asked me to stay behind after class. Result, he must have fallen for this Linda's irresistible charms, didn't he? I shyly stood before him, and in a serious tone, he said, Linda, is everything okay with you? You seem off lately. No, sorry, it's awful. I glumly looked down at my feet and took a few seconds to continue. My family is so poor, and my home life is just horrible. I only have nice things because my friends lend me stuff. His gaze softened. I pretended to dab at my fake tears. Please, don't tell anyone. I couldn't cope with the shame. It's enough just having you to talk to. I smiled at him. Yeah, sure. He looked at me gently and said, Anytime. Oh my. His eyes were so big and blue and mmm. I could drown in them. He obviously liked me too. He just couldn't do anything about it yet as he was nervous. With him being my teacher and all. But soon he'd realize that me and him were so meant to be. Like Ariana Grande and Dalton Gomez. I continued to stay behind after classes so I could talk to Colin about my make-believe terrible home life. He always listened and told me it'd be okay. He was so sweet and sensitive. Then one time I left Colin's classroom to find Scott there waiting for me. Ugh. I told him to go away and started walking, but he followed me. So what? You're into old men now? What? I glared at him. Yeah, I'm not stupid. I know you like Mr. Halton. You need to snap out of that dreamland and see he's on a different level to you. Angered by this, I looked him square in the eye and snidely replied, No, Scott, you're the one on a different level to me. About 50 levels down, to be precise. I gave the thumbs down sign. He looked wounded as he turned his back to me and started walking off. He had it coming. I walked outside to see Scott lingering around, talking to Patty and Lewis. They didn't see me, so I overheard Scott say, She can't see how tragic she's being. You know her. She's so stubborn. Of course, Mr. Halton doesn't like her in that way. Ahem. <clears throat> I faked a cough, and they all turned to look at me. I put my hand on my hip and stared them down. Look, I'm sorry, Linda. We're just worried about you. Yeah, this fantasy of yours will hurt you. Ugh, what did they know? I rolled my eyes. For your information, Colin and I are really dating. In fact, he's taking me out tonight, so I can't hang out. I walked off the other way, knowing full well that the looks on their face would be priceless. I know Colin wasn't actually my boyfriend, yet. But I knew it would happen soon. It was written in the stars. The next day, as I walked into school, I noticed some of the other kids whispering to each other and pointing at me. Okay, weird. Maybe it was my new dress or something. I bought it because it was an exact colored match to Colin's eyes. But things got weirder in physics class, because as soon as Colin walked in, everybody started giggling. Colin looked confused and said, Okay, what's so funny? Then this girl, Sally, shyly muttered out, Sir, we heard you have a new girlfriend. He raised an eyebrow. Y yes, that's correct. How do you know? He gave a nervous laugh. Actually, this shirt is a gift from her. I felt the entire class's eyes turn to me. Well, except for Collins. I tried to keep my cool, but inside I was fuming. How dare some other woman steal my man and force him to wear that hideous shirt? I knew I needed to keep up the lie, so after class, I walked over to Lewis and Patty and said, how cute does Cullen look in that shirt? They both frowned at me. Then Patty replied, So you really are dating him? Yep. 
I gave a nod. Right. She gave a skeptical look. They all needed to realize that Colin and I were the real deal. So I bought a box of candy and cut out a heart-shaped tag saying, Love you, honey, with my candy floss scented gel pen. I did feel kind of nervous as I walked over to him, but our love was meant to be. Hi, Linda. Can I help you? I got you this. I placed the gift down on his desk. He read the note and his face fell. Then, in a firm voice, he said, Look, Linda, this is wrong. No, I shook my head. I know you like me. Linda, please, you're my student. You're just a child. No, we're meant to be together. You love me. I know you do. I don't, he said sternly. Now please leave. He rejected me? This had to be down to his new girlfriend. She was obviously poisoning his mind, as there was no way he couldn't like me. I wasn't leaving the room until he admitted he loved me too. So, crying, I sat down on the floor and folded my arms. Right at that moment, Patty and Louise rushed into the room and helped me up. Then they stared daggers at Colin as they led me out into the corridor. Turned out they'd followed me and observed through the window. How embarrassing. Thinking quick, I blubbered out, He's such a jerk. I devoted all of myself to him, but he's bored of me now, so he dumped me. Just like that. My friends comforted me as they told me he wouldn't get away with it. There's no way I could face Colin again just yet. So, I feigned being sick and stayed home. Only when I returned to school, he wasn't there. Then, the principal called me to their office. I walked in to see both my parents sitting there with devastated looks on their faces. Oh no. What was going on? Sweetie, we're sorry for not protecting you more. Mom looked over at me with glassy eyes. Then the principal said, Mr. Halton has been fired, and the police are investigating him. Rest assured, nothing like this will happen again. Huh? Colin had been fired? Why? Then the reality hit me. It was because they thought he'd been having a relationship with me. I muttered out, No, you've got it all wrong. Nothing happened. Linda, I know this is difficult, but he's a bad man. It didn't matter what I said. They remained convinced that I was so manipulated by Colin that I'd say anything to clear his name. Straight after the meeting, I found Patty and Louise, and they confessed that they hated seeing me so upset, so they'd told the principal about me and Colin. I took a deep breath, then I blurted out, but I made it up, all of it. Of course, they were super angry with me for lying, but after bearing their tantrums for some 30 minutes, they agreed to help me clear his name. So they went to the cop station with me, and we told them everything. It worked, as Colin had his name cleared, but unsurprisingly, he never came back to teach at my school. The three of us were suspended from school, and my parents grounded me for a month. Patty and Louise are still my friends, but I can see they don't trust me anymore. Anytime I tell them anything, they give each other these yeah-right looks. I feel so guilty for everything I did. It was never meant to go that far, but I now realize that my childish behavior almost cost a good man his future. I wish I could apologize to Colin in person, but I know I'll never get a chance to. Please be careful with your words, as they could ruin someone's career, life, everything. If, like me, you adore your teacher, then please just respect them, be nice, and let them be. Hey, Dan? How about we go to that Japanese restaurant I want to try? Um, but my mom's expecting me home for dinner, Dan awkwardly replied. Again? I rose an eyebrow. Predictably, his next move was taking out his phone and calling Mommy Dearest. Mom says eating out is very expensive. It's your idea, so you're paying, okay? Excuse me? Did I mishear him? Unbelievable. So, through gritted teeth, I said, Forget it. I'm going home. Then I left him standing there with a stupid look on his face. Yep, that idiot was my boyfriend, Dan. He's in his twenties, but every conversation is still, My mom this and my mom that. It's so exhausting. At first, I thought I'd found a manly, impeccable man to rely on. Instead, <sighs> It just goes to show you, you can't judge a book by its cover, y'all. It all started with me coming back to the country, and it was hard finding my feet here again. Also, 
I hadn't had a boyfriend for, let's say, a long time. I wasn't that desperate, but my auntie insisted on matchmaking me with this cute guy. I thought, why not? First impressions, Dan was fine. He'd just graduated from a prestigious college, and he seemed so gentle and kind. We spent a good time chit-chatting, so yeah, after that we started dating. It was swell at first. But then the abnormal details about him began to surface. We arranged a date at mine once. The plan was to cook a meal together, then relax watching a movie. But as soon as he arrived, he walked straight over to the couch and started watching TV without any helpful intention. I dragged him into the kitchen, passed him a carrot and the peeler. He looked confused, then stuttered, Er, but I don't know how. I tried to show him. But despite explaining it in great detail, Dan still fumbled to peel one lousy carrot. Then, yep, you guessed it, at one point he called his mom. Then he told me, My mom says the kitchen is a very dangerous place. I could cut or burn myself. We could go back to my place. My mom can do the cooking. I glared at his arms akimbo. Or or we can eat out, Dan mumbled. Only if it's on you, Claire. It's not my fault. I growled while shaking my head. Fine, then I'm not coming with you. Then I pushed him out and slammed the door shut behind him. What the hell just happened? Still, I told myself that maybe he was just scared, since he has never cooked before. One time we were in a clothes shop, and I spotted this shirt that I knew would suit him. It wasn't his usual style, but I insisted he tried it on, and ooh, he looked so good in it. Dan seemed to like it too, as he admired himself in the mirror, then said, It does look nice, but wait, can you please take a photo so I can send it to my mom? Well, she's the one who buys all my clothes, so... What? So now he needed approval from his mom before he bought anything? Jeez. Anyway, I took a couple of photos and he sent them to his mom. They exchanged messages, then he turned to me and said, Okay, mom says you can buy me it. Me? My eyes widened. Yeah, mom says you chose it, so you should buy it for me. Wait, what? I literally froze for seconds. Speechless, I could only glare at him before I found the means to leave. Claire, what's wrong? Dan chased after me, but I ignored him. Okay, I admit that, after a few dates, it was easy to figure out he was a total mommy's boy. But I told myself that it was sweet he loved his mom so much, and I never expected it to be that extreme. After that, I used the silent treatment on him, but he wouldn't quit bugging me. Then, he told me he wanted to take me out to my favorite restaurant as a birthday treat. Ooh, this sounded great! Perhaps he'd realized something and wanted to make it up for me. We were holding hands and walking toward the restaurant when we passed by a shoe store, and in the window display were the perfect pair of boots. Well, I'm a girl, and it was my birthday. I pulled Dan's arm. Danny, look! I pointed at the boots. I want those. I grinned from ear to ear. Okay. Dan replied blandly. My smile faded. I mean, they'd make the best birthday present. Ugh, since when did a girl like me have to ask for a gift? Why? Dan shrugged. You like them, I don't. My face reddened with anger. But it's my birthday. Dan scratched his head and forced a smile. Sorry, babe. Last night I spent my allowance on some new games, so I'm broke now. Pfft. I sneered. Why don't you ask your mom? And he unexpectedly went mad. Hey, you're obviously the wealthier one. How come you keep asking me to buy you stuff? Enough! I stopped dead. I have never, ever dated anyone as awful as you before. You're a grown-ass man, so stop running to your mommy every time you forget how to turn the kettle on or stub your toe. And why on earth do you still get an allowance at your age? It's over. Then I turned to leave without letting him have the last word. So freaking unreal. Trust me, to arrive back in the country and end up straight into this bizarre mommy's boy circumstance. But yeah, at least I was finally free of him now. It's been a few weeks since then, but just the thought of Dan still made me so mad. Ugh, I needed to get out of here and live a little. 
So I called my close friend Philip and arranged to meet him and some of my trusted guy friends at a bar. Cheer up, little girl, he teased. I know what will put a smile on your face. Our gaming group found this hilarious player. All we have to do is throw a few compliments his way, and he buys us all new items. Then, whenever we go out partying after a victory, this noob also pays for it all. What an ego. I mocked, congrats, bros. Wish my ex-date was also that generous. Then I rolled my eyes. He never spent a cent. Well, at least not without asking his mom for permission first. Philip laughed with a surprise. Hey, this noob's the same. He brags that despite being broke, his mom came up with the idea of matching him with rich girls so he can be covered. Hold up. That didn't sound right. I had a real bad feeling about this. Then Philip pointed across the bar and said, Oh, speak of the devil, and patted my back. A chill ran down my spine as I took a deep inhale of breath and turned to see it was Dan. And oh, he had a new girlfriend already. I quickly made up some excuse and bailed before they saw me. That night, I couldn't stop thinking about Dan's new girlfriend. Whatever Dan and his mom were doing was no less than scamming. So I arranged to meet up with Philip at a diner, and I confided in him about my history with Dan and how I was concerned about his new girlfriend. Philip offered to help and said he would try and find out more information. A few days later, he reported back with his findings. Turns out, Dan and his mom had learned the Claire lesson, so this time with his new girlfriend, Lizzie, they were playing it differently. Dan, as his mom had ordered, took some sensitive photos of Lizzie, and now every time she refused to pay for something, he threatened to post them online. OMG! This made me feel so sick! This poor girl was trapped and were sucked dry of all her money. This was extortion, and I was going to put a stop to it. It didn't take long for me to find Lizzie online. I then dropped her a message saying I wanted to help, and we arranged to meet up in person. After hearing me say that I knew the truth, Lizzie burst into tears. I can't let those pictures get out, so I have to keep on being his girlfriend and pay for everything. She rubbed the tears off her cheeks. I had to borrow money, and now the interest means I'm in thousands of dollars worth of debt, and I still have no guts to speak out. Let's put an end to this. I slammed my fist on the table. Be brave, Lizzie. I've got your back. The day after Philip and I went with Lizzie to tell her parents, it was bad. Her mom started blubbering and tried to cover her face while her dad went furious. No one does this to my little girl and gets away with it. Philip replied, Too right. The bad guys are going down. We spent the rest of the day gathering evidence, including all of the threatening messages Dan had sent her and the receipts she'd kept from the extortionate purchases he'd forced her to make for him. That was when Lizzie received a message from Dan. There's this expensive restaurant I want to go to. Babe, take me there tonight or else. Love you, X. Lizzie replied that she agreed. Then knowing Dan was out, we went around to his house. We confronted Dan's mom as soon as she let us inside. She was frightened and eventually confessed that she didn't have a job and it was Dan's dad who provided for them. As a result, she spoiled Dan so badly that it annoyed his dad, so he left. Then she sadly blurted out, He didn't say a word to me. He just left Dan a note that said, Take care of yourself and your mom. I knew Dan would be miserable without his luxuries, so I told him to find a rich girlfriend to spoil him and this time she looked from me to Lizzie to make sure she would be too trapped to ever leave. There was a knock at the door. She looked at us awkwardly before she went to answer it. We followed her, and that was when we saw two cops arresting her. She bursted into tears as they took her away. I guess she thought she was a devoted mother who was doing right by her son, when, in truth, she went about it in totally the wrong way. She ended up going to jail, and her house was sold to pay off Lizzie's debts, As for mommy's boy Dan, as an accomplice, he ended up doing community restitution. Hey, this would probably do him some good, as he'd finally learn what a day's hard work actually felt like. Huh. Thankfully, Lizzie gradually got over this traumatizing event and was ready to start dating again. With Philip. Hmm. About me, well, I'm still single, but I don't feel lonely anymore, as I have awesome friends. Besides, 
This way I have no guys bumming money off me. <laughs> Job hunting is so not fun. But my current job as a waitress isn't working out. There's too much standing around. I now have a blister on my foot. Totally disgusting. Ooh, hang on. This one sounded interesting. Retired couple seeks a well-mannered female housekeeper to attend to their country estate. Board and meals included. This job sounded like such an easy ride, so I called them immediately. And yep, they invited me over. So, this is their country estate. Jeez, it's basically a castle. The owner, Mrs. Harris, answered the door. She seemed friendly enough, and she gave me a tour of the place. I expected her to interview me or something, but in the end, she just showed me a bedroom, then said, I hope this room is adequate enough for you. You'll start tomorrow. My husband and I are away from home quite often. All you have to do is keep an eye on the place and play with our son, as he does get lonely. Huh? I didn't see anything about babysitting in the job description. But I mean, come on, how bad could playing with some little kid be? And who cares? This was the perfect job. They were paying me a high salary to do practically nothing. Not even cleaning or cooking, as they had many maids for that. This was over the top. Some people had way more money than cents. I needed to hurry up and move in. For the first few days, the Harrises weren't around, and I didn't see any signs of a kid. I mooched around the mansion and explored the grounds. Then one day, I was on the third floor inspecting a funny-looking portrait when I heard footsteps behind me. Startled, I turned around and saw a guy holding a teddy bear and licking a lollipop. He was looking straight at me. Okay, weird. Hello? And you are? I asked. Fred, he said, with a very childish tone. Huh? He was like almost 30 already. How come he spoke like that? Fred wants to play. He raised the teddy bear up to my face, like an invitation. All right, I shrugged, then followed him into his room. Whoa. It was like a toy store in there. He wheeled a toy truck over to me, so I took it and made car sounds as I moved it around. He clapped his hands and cheered excitedly. I ended up spending the rest of the day there playing these childish games with him. Then when I looked up, I saw Mr. and Mrs. Harris standing in the doorway. And beside them was a cameraman who was filming Fred and me. They asked to talk privately, so I followed them out to the garden. Mr. Harris started. Fred is our only son. Past traumas affected him. So now, although he appears to be an adult man, he still acts like a kid. Now that made sense. And too bad for him, though. The story continued that Mr. and Mrs. Harris used to work in the media. A few years ago, they decided to record Fred's daily activities, then edited them into videos to make a weekly series on social media. Wow. A show about a man acting like a child? How strange. The audience loves watching Freddy. Mrs. Harris giggled, but then she immediately changed her tone. But I do worry they'll soon get tired of watching just him. I think he should have a friend. It will help the show, and it'll be good for Freddy as he'll feel less lonely. I wonder. She looked at me all wide-eyed. Noticing my skeptical look. Mr. Harris jumped in before I even opened my mouth. We'll pay you double. Whoa, what a deal. I mean, it's not like I needed to be an award-winning actress or anything to be in this type of videos. Most importantly, that amount of money was insane. Only an idiot would have turned down an offer like this, right? So I started being friends with Fred. We shared toys, played in the garden, and did all those childlike things together. To be honest, I found him really sweet, and I felt sorry for him. Whenever he saw me, he beamed at me, and usually handed me his favorite toy, and that made me feel good. So, okay, the cameraman followed us around all day, but I soon forgot he was there. And I also never check out the final videos, as I found it cringy to watch myself. Then one day, the Harris's sat me down to talk to me again. 
Mrs. Harris looked at me as she said, You may consider Freddy as a child, but he is now a 27-year-old man, handsome and physically healthy. He likes you, and he has every right to date. Then after showing me several comments on the internet, they told me frankly that the views would be higher if I became Fred's girlfriend. So, is it some kind of real-life fairy tale? A kind-hearted girl falls in love with a mentally disadvantaged man? Jeez. But I'm not into him that way. I groaned, pulling a wry face. Darling. She touched my arm. It would only be for the camera. And it would make Freddy so happy. And of course, you'll be generously compensated. Mr. Harris added. Oof. That much money? Who could say no? And it was only acting. Besides, Fred enjoyed making the videos, right? They must have had millions of views for the Harrises to throw money around like this. So I quit hesitating and agreed. They handed me an improv script and told me to do exactly whatever was written in it. The more convincing my performance, the higher my salary. Oh man, not long ago, I didn't have a cent to my name. And now I had thousands of dollars in my bank account. I could go to college, get myself an apartment, etc. A bright future was ahead for me. In the first video, I sat down next to Fred, took his hand, but he immediately started a thumb war. So I gave up on the hand-holding and softly said, Fred, I love spending time with you. You're so sweet and kind, and I have feelings for you. He let out an excitable shout. Then he pretended to be an airplane and did loops around the room. The next few videos didn't get any easier. When I tried to snuggle up to him, he'd whack me with his giant teddy bear. And when I went in for a kiss on his cheek, he pressed a toy car into my face. That was why when I read the next script, in which we were going to have a romantic dinner together, I couldn't help sighing and rolling my eyes. But it was work. So I put on a pretty dress and walked into the dining room. It was decorated with flower petals on the table, and there was mood lighting. Delicious? I asked while he was stuffing his face. He nodded, threw down the silverware, and clapped his hands. Fred cooks for Lynn Eats! Fred chewed as he spoke, spitting food all over. Man, this was so hilarious, I couldn't help laughing. Then he walked over to me and hugged me tightly. Oh my god. He got food stains all over my dress. <laughs> I looked straight into his eyes and thought, yeah, I did like him as a cute little brother. Poor guy. If only he wasn't so unfortunate. Suddenly, I felt his hands tightening around my waist. Stunned, I pushed him back and feigned interest in my food. A huge amount of money was transferred into my account that month, but I didn't feel so youthful anymore. So I started going off script and doing things that I thought were good for Fred. I used his toys to teach him math skills. I read him good books, and I showed him how to make cupcakes. One evening, when I was walking back to my room, Mr. Harris blocked my path and scowling at me said, What the hell are you playing at? Did you even read this week's script? I tried pushing past him, but he grabbed my arm. You're causing our viewers to leave. I'm paying you less this month. I shook myself free of his grip and replied, Money? Is that all that matters to you? Then I rolled my eyes and returned to my room. That night, I ended up looking up the videos. In one of the older ones, Fred was in a suit and looked super uncomfortable. Every time he tried to loosen the tie or unbutton the shirt, a stick went in the frame and hit him in the butt. After a few tries, Fred threw himself on the floor and started having a tantrum. There were so many comments like, OMG, this is way too hilarious, and grow up, man, or don't, for our entertainment. Oh no, people were so mean. Fred didn't choose to be like that. The Harrises were using their own son to get rich by making fun of him. Poor Fred. I had to stop this. I packed my bag, stormed into the room where the Harrises were watching TV, and said, I like Fred, and still want to be his friend, but I'm not going to be part of this freak show anymore. I quit, and if you care about Fred at all, I suggest you do the same. 
I expected them to beg me to stay or something, but Mrs. Harris just snarked. All right then, if you want to quit, just leave. Why bother making a fuss about all this? Girls like you won't be hard to replace anyway. How ruthless were they? I was fueled with anger. So I left their dumb mansion immediately and didn't look back. And guess who is cooking in my kitchen while I'm telling you this crazy story? Yep, it's Fred. A few weeks after I left, I answered the doorbell to find Fred standing there. Crazier still, he was acting completely normal. Turns out the Harrises were neglectful of Fred, so he was raised by an old butler, like Bruce and Alfred. When Fred was 15, his parents ended up jobless and in debt. Fred told me, I wanted their attention so badly, so I started acting like I was still a little kid. But then his cute, silly actions meant his parents came up with their crazy video idea. They lied about Fred's age since he does look a bit older, then made him solo act Dumb and Dumber on camera for years. At first, I thought this would be a good way to help my parents overcome their financial difficulties, but I soon grew tired of pretending, and they had more than enough money, so I told them to stop, but they refused. Then he told me that the night I left, he got into a heated argument with his parents and told them he wasn't doing the show ever again. I don't know anyone else and have feelings for no one else but you. He confessed. And whoa, turns out he's only 19. So I let him stay with me and, well, we started dating. Like real romantic dates and a real romantic grown-up relationship. I still have a lot of money in my account, and Fred took all the money he deserved from his parents, then moved in with me. I'm starting college next month, and I can't wait. Meanwhile, Fred has found an online course and is waiting for the results from the new part-time job. Also online. Well, he's gotta hide for quite a while, since his face is all over the internet. But our future together is really wide open this time. Now, excuse me. We have a dinner date to enjoy. This is a real life fairy tale, baby. I was standing outside of college chatting to my friends when suddenly a police car pulled up and from the car's window, a handsome police officer waved at me, then told me to hurry up. I excitedly waved back at him, said goodbye to my friends, and rushed to him in front of their admiring eyes. So, I'm Daisy, and the handsome cop is Levi, my amazing, brave boyfriend. We first met at the library in town. I was there for my studies, and he was looking for some crime books. We started dating, and now a year later, we're madly in love. There are so many things that I love about dating a cop, such as seeing him in his uniform. It never fails to make me beam with pride, and... I'm not gonna lie, he has abs of steel due to all of his workouts. Swoon! Besides, he has the cutest quirky habits. Like, when we go to a restaurant or the theater, he always scans it first to check if it's safe. But as good as being with him is, there are a few bum points, such as his unpredictable work schedule. Day, night, weekends, you name it, he works it. Then, when we finally manage to plan something, he sometimes got an emergency phone call and had to bail on me. This sucked, especially when it was my sister's wedding. But without a doubt, the most annoying thing of all is his popularity with other girls. They're like moths to a flame around him, especially this one colleague of his, Ellie. One time, Levi brought his colleague Brad over while I was there studying. I heard Brad remark, Levi, I never thought you'd end up with a bookworm. I thought you'd end up with Ellie. Everyone can see you two have a strong connection. Levi tried laughing it off and saying that it was nonsense, but the jealousy rose up in me. By the time Brad left, I was really upset about it, so I packed up my books and went to leave. He stopped me and asked me what was wrong. Trying my best not to cry, I blurted out, Why aren't you with Ellie? You spend all your time with her. He shook his head, smirked, then said, Ignore Brad. He's a joker. And yeah, 
I spend time with Ellie. I work with her. But it's you I love, and everyone knows it. In fact, why don't you move in? Then we can spend more time together. My sadness was soon overlapped by happiness, and I jumped into his arms and squealed out, Really? Yes, for sure! This was so exciting. I moved in a few weeks later, and at first, living with Levi was the best thing ever. But over time, there were little niggling things that started to play on my mind. For example, one day I was chatting to the new neighbor when Levi arrived home and in a stone-cold voice demanded I go inside. Then he sternly told me never to talk to strangers. But come on, I'm a naturally chatty, friendly girl who loves talking to people and making new friends. I don't know, I guess it was me overreacting? I mean, he was just looking out for me, right? But then, his need for control worsened when once, I arranged to meet my friends in town. Levi was going to come too, but then he had a last-minute work call and couldn't. When I said I'd just get a taxi, he freaked out and told me I couldn't go. After I got upset about it, he reluctantly agreed to let me go. He called a reputable taxi firm to pick me up then told me I had to be back by 10 p.m. But after a few drinks, I lost all sense of time. I was just having too much fun. I was dancing with my friend when Levi stormed in, grabbed my arm, and pulled me out of there. Everyone was staring at us, not helped because he was in his cop uniform. I even heard one man tut out, It's always the innocent-looking ones, isn't it? It was so embarrassing. At home, I sat there brooding while he got me a glass of water. When he tried passing it to me, I jumped up to my feet and screamed at him. You're being ridiculous! And thanks to you, everyone in the bar thinks I'm some sort of criminal! I don't need a curfew! It's not like that, he sighed. But I was so upset, I brushed past him and slammed the bedroom door behind me. I cried myself to sleep. I hated arguing with him. I gave him silent treatment throughout the next day. But then in the evening, he arrived home with a gift box and apologized for making me sad. That was so sweet. I gave him a hug and said, I'm sorry too. Then I opened the box. It was a really lovely watch. I noticed that it had an extra button on it, but I didn't think much of it. I stared down at it admirably as he fixed it on my wrist. That's how caring my boyfriend was so I decided to buy him something too. The next day after college, I went to the mall. Suddenly, Levi called me and asked me where I was. I wanted the gift to be a surprise, so I told him I was at home. Crossly, he said, Daisy, don't lie to me. I know you're at High Hill Shopping Mall. Come home at once. Huh? How did he know that? I gave up on finding a gift and went home. When he got back, I asked him how he knew where I was, and I saw him briefly glance at my watch. Then, he admitted that he had GPS fitted to it, but it was only so he could keep me safe. What? I wasn't a kid anymore. How could he use it to follow me? We had a huge fight, and I told him he was controlling and crazy, and he needed to stop treating me like a little kid. Then I shut myself away in the bedroom. The next day, when I woke up, Levi had already left for work. I was so wound up, so I decided to go for a jog to clear my head. Obviously, I left the watch at home, and also my phone. When I got back, I was about to head for the shower when I heard my phone ringing. It was Levi. Then I noticed that I had 50 missed calls and a ton of messages from him. What? This wasn't normal. I'd only been gone for an hour at the most. Anyways... I put the watch back on, then suddenly, the door banged open and Levi stormed in, and he yelled at me, Are you okay? Where did you go? Why didn't you answer my calls? This sucked, as I love him, but I knew I couldn't live like this anymore. So, I told him I needed my freedom, then headed for the door. He looked so mad, as he grabbed my hand, pulled me into the upstairs room, then locked me inside. I banged on the door and pleaded with him to let me out. Daisy, trust me. This is for your own good. You're not safe out there. Then I heard his footsteps trail off and knew he'd left. 
I curled up into a ball and cried myself to sleep. When I woke up, it was getting pretty dark out there. I searched the room for something to help me and found a rope ladder. The perks of living with a prepared cop. I used it to climb out of the window. But as soon as I reached the ground, two men appeared. Then suddenly, the world turned black. When I opened my eyes, I realized that I was in a dark, damp room and I was tied up. The two men were sitting by the door and talking to each other. I began to panic. I'd seen enough movies to know that this was bad. One of the men looked over at me, and I quickly closed my eyes. But it was too late. He'd seen I was awake. So he walked over and said, Ah, welcome back, sweetheart. Panicked, I asked, Who are you? Why me? He sniggered out, Ah, yes. If only that boyfriend of yours was here. Then we could ask him. Then he picked up his phone, and seconds later, I heard Levi's voice in the other line. Hello? Remember me? We seem to have something of yours. I heard the fear in Levi's voice. Let her go! Your wife's death wasn't her fault! It's your fault she's dead. Now it's your turn to lose the woman you love. Come here alone, if you want to see her face again. And don't even think about calling for backup. He hung up the phone, then peered down at me, before he kicked the empty barrel next to me. I jolted back, and he laughed. It was terrifying. Not long after that, they dragged a beaten-up man into the room. Levi! Oh no! Levi managed to look at me, forced a smile, and slurred out, My flower girl, don't worry, I'm here now. The gang laughed at this. Then he stopped in front of Levi and said, I think you and me need a little chat. Let's call it man business. I knew I needed to find a way to help him. But what? That's when I looked down at my watch. It already had GPS, so perhaps the extra button did something. I struggled to press it, which wasn't easy with roped hands, trust me. But eventually, I managed to. By this point, Levi was unconscious and I started sobbing. I didn't want to lose him. Not like this. The one man set something up next to him. Oh no, it was a bum! He sneered out. You have 30 minutes left to say goodbye to your lover, boy. Then the man left. I called Levi's name and sobbed out how I loved him. I honestly thought we were both going to die there. And watching the timer count down to our doom was the worst feeling ever. Suddenly, the door burst open. At first, I thought it was those men back again. But instead, Brad and his team rushed over, saw the bomb, then quickly got both me and Levi out of there. I was pushed to the ground just before there was a big bang, and the house exploded. On the way to the hospital, Ellie explained everything to me. So, Turns out, this involved a difficult criminal case that happened last year. Levi had been investigating a group of drug dealers, but an incident happened, and the gang's leader's wife accidentally fell from the building and died. They arrested most of the dealers, but some got away, including the gang leader. Then recently, Levi had received images of me outside college and our house from them, and took this as a threat to my safety. Well... That explained all of Levi's controlling and weird behavior. I felt so bad for misjudging Levi. He was the sweetest, bravest man, and I loved him so much. I stayed by his side as he recovered in hospital. Then one day, he finally opened his eyes, looked at me, and muttered out, There's my flower girl. I hugged him. Gently, of course. It was such a relief to know he was going to be okay. The gang is still out there somewhere, but hopefully they'll catch them soon. I do worry about it, but it's okay, as I know I have Levi to protect me. After all, he's my real-life action hero, and I know that with him by my side, we'll get through anything.
This shift was boring. So as I handed the two coffees over to the girl, I couldn't help but daydream about what to have for lunch. Um, excuse me, why the attitude? The girl sounded annoyed. Then before I could say anything, she shouted, I want to speak to your manager. The boy next to her tried to keep her calm and asked her to go outside first. Then he said to me, I'm sorry about my sister. I mumbled, it's okay, as I handed him $20 change. Oh, just keep it, he smiled. But then he started apologizing, took the change, then left. What just happened? I took out my phone to check my face. Oh, great. I looked like I was sucking on wasps. And all because I was thinking about whether I should have pasta or a sandwich. (sighs) Well, to be honest, what just happened wasn't new to me, but it never seemed to get any easier. Let me start at the beginning. So, I'm Isabel. I had just graduated from high school and was soon to be a freshman at college. Ever since I can remember, my parents, friends, and teachers always asked me the same questions, such as, what's wrong? And why the long face? When I told them that I was fine, they would always be like, are you sure? Or, there's a problem, you need to tell us, okay? Oh, it was so frustrating. There was even this one time where my teacher had to stop in the middle of a lesson to ask me not to look at her like that because my stare made her feel uncomfortable. What? I was just really focused. Then I eventually found out in high school it was on a normal sunny day. I was sitting at the bus stop with my best friend Jocelyn when some guy came over and asked for directions. I looked up and the guy got startled and began to stutter. Oh, sorry for, for bothering you. And then he left in a hurry. Huh? This was so confusing. He didn't even give me a chance to get a word out. So I turned to Jocelyn and asked if she might know what the guy's problem was. Um, maybe it's because you look like you want to kick his butt. Then she told me how everyone at school thought I was an arrogant snob. What? That was ridiculous. Why would they think of me like that? I asked her this, and she took out a mirror and held it to my face. Well, see it for yourself. I took a deep look in the mirror, and oh my god, she was right. I did look a bit moody, but I swear I wasn't. Not at all. The next day, Jocelyn sent me a link to an article. It was about people having a naturally grumpy face, also known as resting bee face, aka RBF. You know the word. No wonder nobody likes me and wants to be friends with me. Well, except Jocelyn, thank God. She saw beyond my sullen-looking exterior. I wanted college to be different, so I was determined to say goodbye to snobby Isabel and say hello to happy, joyful Isabel. I just needed to smile all the time. Sounds easy, right? So on my first day at college, I walked into the lecture hall with the biggest smile fixed on my face. I hoped I looked friendly and not like that creepy cat from Alice in Wonderland, but then my smile immediately vanished when I saw him. It was the guy who wanted to tip me $20 and then ran off with it. Ugh, why was he here? I was trying to come across as a sweet, friendly girl, and I didn't need him spreading rude rumors about me. So the easiest solution was to avoid this guy as much as possible. Only the universe had other ideas, and I found myself stuck doing a group project with him. Ugh, great. We all sat in a circle, and I found out he's called Carter. Our group leader, Carla, assigned each of us a task. While listening to her, I tried to hold my smile as brightly as I could. Keep it steady. Steady! I thought to myself over and over. But you know what? Fake smiling is hard work, and it causes serious face ache. Then my cheek started twitching, so to avoid looking like a weirdo, I decided to take a break from smiling. And that's when Carla noticed me and asked, Did I say something wrong? Everybody was gawping at me. I could feel myself blushing. Great, now I probably resembled a grumpy tomato. That's when Carter spoke up. Just continue. We'll say if anything's unclear. Thank you, Carter. Now, I know how Lewis Lane felt after being rescued by Superman. This felt even more intense than the movie. And oh, he was actually kind of cute, too. I felt a little bummed out. After the group meeting, all I wanted to do was make some friends, but 
I'd already given Carla the wrong impressions about myself. I'm not a big party goer, but perhaps a big freshman party happening on Friday would be a good place to make friends, right? Feeling down, I sat on the side of the bench by the college sports field and just looked up to the sky. Then I noticed Carter playing soccer with some guys. So I watched him play for a bit. It could have been the lighting, or the fact he looked so hot when sweaty, but I couldn't take my eyes off him. Maybe I should try talking to him. The next day, I walked into the lecture hall and spotted Carter sitting alone, reading a book. This was my chance. I could sit next to him and start a convo. Okay, Isabel, keep it cool. Oh no, not cool. Cool means arrogant. Keep it happy. You got this. Smile on. Check. Hi, is this seat... Carter looked up. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this was your seat. Then he gathered his stuff and moved to another table. What? Ugh, curse you, RBF. I wasn't giving up this easily, so I searched online and read that makeup could help fix my situation. So, I applied makeup around my mouth and eyes, then went to my lecture. Only during the group discussion, Carter whispered to me, Are you sick? As you look a bit pale. Why don't you go home? I can take notes for you. After hearing him say that, I actually did feel a bit sick. Sick of the constant failure. But wait, this Friday was the party. That would be my last opportunity to make friends and talk to Carter. I'd never been to a party before, mainly because no one had ever invited me to one. Pretty sure they thought my grumpy look would kill the mood. (sighs) So I spent ages deliberating on an outfit opting for a bright-colored dress to make me look more cheerful. As I walked into the party, I couldn't stop shaking. Everyone looked like they were having a great time, while I just looked like a grumpy kid longing for their mama. It's okay, Isabel. Keep calm, I told myself. I just needed a couple drinks to boost my confidence. So, I got a couple of shots from the bar, and wow, I immediately felt like a whole new person. I was about to bravely talk to some girls when suddenly a guy came over to me and said, Hey, looks like you're having a bad time. If you don't like these things, I think you should just go home. It's okay. Great. If even alcohol couldn't help me, then what else could? I lost all interest in making friends, so I decided to take the random guy's advice and leave. Everyone would have far more fun without having to see my moody face anyway. As I hurried out of there, I heard someone shout, Isabel, wait up. I turned around and saw that it was Carter. He caught up with me and asked why I was leaving so early. I muttered out how partying wasn't really my thing and I'd rather hang out somewhere else. Yeah, I'm not so keen on them either. Can I come with you? I froze for a minute, but I guess he presumed I was angry with him as he apologized and went to leave. Oh, hell no. No way am I gonna let him slip away again. So I said quickly, Of course you can come! but it came out as loud screaming. The poor guy must have felt like a tiger was growling in front of his face. Well, at least he was still coming with me, right? Even if it was out of fear, he looked a little unsure as I led him toward one of my favorite places, which was underneath this bridge, but when he saw all of the awesome graffiti, he seemed to be more at ease. He had fun, looking from one piece to the next. Then we started talking, and turns out we could get on pretty well. We soon became close friends, and I even introduced him to Jocelyn. The more I spent time with Carter, the more I liked him, and I started to think that he liked me too. Don't ask me why. It's just a gut feeling. Then one day I opened the door to see Carter standing there with his huge bouquet and a cute gift box. Oh, sweet lord. Were they for me? I knew I needed to say something, so I mumbled out, Who is that for? Ouch. Did that sound a bit harsh? Should I ask again? And maybe with a softer voice and a smile. But before I could say anything, Carter replied, Um, oh, these are for Jocelyn. Can you please give them to her? Thanks. He handed me them, then ran off. What? Carter was in love with Jocelyn? But hey, it's no shocker that good things never happen to me, and someone with a naturally joyful look like her would get all the guys. Let's face it, who wants a mean-looking girlfriend? This sucked. After that, I purposefully avoided Carter, and we didn't talk at all for a week. It was all too much. So one day after lectures, I went to my happy place under the bridge. What? There was this new graffiti drawing. 
It was huge, ugly, and I think it was for me. As in dried, dripping letters, it said, I love you, Isabel. I stared at it, open-mouthed. Was this someone's idea of a joke? Then someone came up alongside me. It was Carter. It's not my finest work, but I tried, he said coyly. Huh? He did this, but why? Then he continued, The flowers and gift were for you, but I thought you were annoyed, so I freaked out and said they were for Jocelyn. So afterward, I called her and told her the truth, and she said that you like me too. Now that explains the weird looks Jocelyn has been giving me. I was so having words with her later. <laughs> you know, I drew that a week ago. I've been following you every day after college. Um, not in a, in a creepy way. I just wanted to be here when you first saw it. And oh man, it was so worth it. Then he gave me the cutest smile and pulled me in for a hug. Oh, wow. This guy knew how to make a girl melt. And you know what? I was smiling, and I wasn't forcing it. So that's it. We became an official couple. Turns out he doesn't care if I have a RBF or not, as he took the time out to discover the real me. You should never judge a book by its cover, as you might miss out on the best adventure ever. So, if that girl or guy looks a bit miserable, then maybe you shouldn't rule them out as being arrogant and moody, and instead, give them a chance. Not to brag, but these are really tasty. I bet even Grace, my picky sister, would finish this whole thing in one sitting. My cooking abilities were definitely up there with Michelin star chefs. I took another bite out of a fajita when I heard noises coming from the living room. Ah, Grace must be back. There she was, sprawled out on the couch, surrounded by her handbag, heels, jacket, and other stuff. Grace, we've talked about this. I can't keep on tidying up after you. I have studying to do, I said as I picked up her things. Suddenly, Grace sat up, rested her head in her hands, then looked at me with sad eyes. An uneasy feeling welled up in my heart. Oh no, what was wrong? She sighed and as she glumly stared at the floor, she said, Easton, pack your things. We're moving out tomorrow. What? Again? I couldn't contain my shock. Why, Grace? Do you owe someone money again? Grace didn't answer, so I worriedly asked, How much do you owe this time? Seven thousand dollars, she mumbled. What? Seven thousand dollars? That's crazy. What did you borrow so much money for? I plopped down on the sofa in disbelief. I sat there, frantically wondering how to deal with Grace's enormous debt. Her extravagant spending habits had started after our parents passed away. I guess she was trying to numb out her grief with the latest must-have outfit. Then suddenly, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Come on, bro, I'm just kidding. Huh? I gaped at her. Grace, it's not funny. For an instance there, I actually thought we'd have to elope or something. She grinned at me. Um, if there's no debt, then why are we moving again? I followed her as she walked out of the room, took a piece of fajita, and popped it in her mouth. Then she began to tell me everything. Turns out she'd found herself a sugar daddy fiancé, and we were moving in with him. I frowned at her. So what, now you're marrying some granddad? Why do you... Without letting me finish my sentence, Grace tapped my head with her knuckle. Do you seriously think a beautiful and famous model like me would marry some old man? Yet, even as a famous model, you still can't afford all of your branded goods. Then you have to keep on moving house all the time to avoid the debt collectors. I winked at Grace. She was about to hit me on the head again, but I dodged it. Ha! The next morning, there was a knock at the door, so I opened it to find a good-looking man in his mid-forties standing there. Ah, turns out he's Owen, my future brother-in-law. Before I had a chance to say anything, Grace tottered over in her heels and wrapped her arms around his neck. Honey, why are you so late? I'm so nervous. Smiling, Owen said, Darling, there's nothing to worry about. Everything's ready to welcome you and Easton. They continued coddling each other, so I quickly walked away. Seeing them like that gave me goosebumps. Ugh, cheesy. Owen drove us to his house. 
well, I say house, but it was more like a royal palace. Inside there was a classic design to the place, with a luxurious style. I spotted a girl about my age sitting on the couch. Her arms were folded, and she had a disgruntled look on her face. Owen looked at her and said, Vivian, why are you still sitting there? Come and welcome your stepmom and uncle. Vivian smirked and coldly replied, No thanks. I'm not in the market for a new stepmom, especially one who's barely out of high school. Then she stormed off, slamming the door behind her. Oh no, she hates me. Does she? Seeing Grace look worried, Owen, though obviously a little angry, still tried to reassure her. It's okay, she's just being a typical teenager. Give her a few days and I'm sure she'll be fine. As for me, I was a little... No, I had to admit that I was very nervous. Vivian's sharp-eyed look had made me feel uncomfortable. I mean, I think a tank full of sharks would have been more welcoming than her. Looks like my new home life wouldn't be easy. The next morning, while I was helping Grace take some pictures of her posing in the living room, you know, for the gram, she suddenly yelled so loud that I had almost dropped the phone. Hey, hey, take that dog out right now! Hurry up! I turned around and saw Vivian walking what looked like a white cloud across the room. Seeing that, I ran toward her and said, Vivian, please take it outside, as Grace is allergic to dog fur. Vivian rolled her eyes and replied, This is my home, and this is my dog. Then she smirked as she let go of the dog lead. Oops! Her fluffy cloud dog immediately ran over to Grace and started barking at her. Grace yelped out, grabbed the pillow, then tried using it as a shield as she continued to scream at the dog to go away. At that moment, Owen appeared from upstairs, and with an angry look on his face, he snapped at her. Vivian, get Teddy out of here right now. No, it's them who should leave, she argued, while her dog barked so hard that Grace huddled up tighter in the corner of the couch and cried nonstop. Vivian, you've been warned. If you do it again, then I'll have no choice but to find Teddy a new home. Owen shouted loudly. Vivian huffed out, then gave Grace a fierce look as she picked up the dog and walked off. Man, it was true that life here wasn't easy at all. And it was about to get a lot harder. The next day, I was rearranging my new room when I heard a loud noise coming from downstairs. I went to check it out and found Grace instructing two maids on where to hang a giant print from one of her modeling photo shoots. And laying on the ground was the picture of Vivian with Owen and her mom. Move a little right? N no, a little left. Okay, Grace ordered them. I hurried over to her and asked, Um, what are you doing? She smiled. I'm just making a few decor adjustments. It looks far more luxurious now, don't you think? Then she picked a gray vase off the table and threw it into the trash can, then placed a double swan figurine in its place. Now that's much better, she rubbed her hands together. God, I know Grace was just trying to claim her position as host, but even so, she shouldn't have taken down the picture of Vivian's mom, if she knew. At that moment, a scream interrupted my train of thought. Vivian's. Sigh. I knew it. Grace, how dare you? Vivian blushed with anger. Then Grace interrupted her. This is my house too, and I have the right to put my mark on it. It makes the room look far more modern. No, you have no right. Take down that disgusting picture and put the old one back. This is my house and your father will soon be my husband. So I can do what I please. So stop your childish strops and just accept it. Vivian resentfully picked up the family picture, then quietly took it up to her room. As a witness to it all, I have to be honest, I thought Grace was being outrageous. After all, Vivian's mother passed away not too long ago, so it was only natural to not accept the stepmother, right? But now Grace was messing things up and seemed to want to delete all of the images of Vivian's mother in this house. That wasn't cool. That evening, I was reading The Theory of Everything in the garden when I felt a pat on my shoulder. I looked up to see Owen. Easton, I'm just letting you know that schools are all set up for you. You start next week. Then he added, Ah, you don't have a car yet, do you? I shall ask Vivian to give you a lift. You're in the same class anyway. Wait, what? I was actually going to the most prestigious and expensive school in the area? 
that's a dream come true, but I heard that all the other kids that went there were rich and influential. Could a poor guy like me adapt to the luxurious environment there? A feeling of uneasiness suddenly welled up in my heart. But then I told myself that everything would be fine. Monday morning arrived and I made sure I was ready early. I lingered around in the kitchen waiting for Vivian, but 30 minutes later and she still hadn't appeared. I started to panic as I didn't want to be late on my first day. That was the type of bad first impression that would stick. I was about to walk to the bus stop when I saw Vivian slowly coming down the stairs. She winced at me and said, Oh, you're still here. I suppose you want to come with me then? I didn't answer and just followed her to the car. As soon as I sat down, she sped away. I hadn't even fastened my seatbelt yet, which I then tried to do in a fumbled panic. Every time she pressed down on the accelerator, my heart skipped a beat. Then after some hellish ten minutes, she stopped the car. Whew! I was still alive. But hang on. This wasn't school. I turned to Vivian and stammered to ask her, but she cut me off. Get out of my car, and if you dare tell anyone how you know me, you will pay! Then she raised her fist to my face. Wow, she didn't have to be that aggressive. But fine, anyway. I didn't want to have anything to do with her either. As I briskly walked to school, I found myself worrying that this would be like it was in the movies, and I'd be teased for being the newbie. The school came into view, and damn. It was even more spectacular in real life. I took a deep breath to muster up the courage to enter the school. The grandeur and beauty of the place was so overwhelming. I was used to graffiti-covered desks and a jam locker door. Not here. Even the restroom door signs were expensive looking. I was wandering aimlessly trying to find my classroom when suddenly, I saw this girl walk ahead and drop something. I picked it up and called after her. Sorry, is this yours? The girl turned around then squeaked out, Oh my god, thank you. You're my knight in shining armor. I can't live without my glossy lipstick. Then she started doing this odd pose. Then she pouted and flicked out her hair. Was this a rich girl thing? It was very confusing, but hey, I guess she seemed nice. I smiled at her, then turned to walk away. That's when I noticed the groups of girls in the corridor. They were all staring at me, and one of them even winked. Then I overheard some of them talking about me. One of them said, Ooh, he's cute. And another said, It's about time we had a new hot boy in this school. Well... Girls from rich schools were weird. I know I'm quite a good-looking guy, but I'd never had girls act like this toward me before. I chuckled inwardly and went to find my class. It seemed inevitable that my school life was destined to be rather, um, interesting. I was sitting in the reception with an ice pack pressed to my head, waiting for my mom to come pick me up. Ugh! That stupid rogue ball during P.E. Oh, there she was, glamorous as always. She rushed over and hugged me, checking if I was okay. Then she guided me out of there and along the hallway. A group of teenage boys stopped dead and stared open-mouthed as we walked by. One even wolf whistled. Even my math teacher, who was walking out of his classroom, started readjusting his tie and waved over at us. No. Those reactions weren't for me. They were for my mom. She's just too beautiful to ever be faced by how men act around her. On the way back home, I got a message from my bestie, Minnie. I bet men would all compete to win a date with your mom. She was like a goddess earlier. I giggled to myself. The thought of a bunch of adult men competing to win my mom's affection amused me. I couldn't understand why my mom was still single. She's gorgeous, successful and a really kind person. And I guessed she'd enjoy having a man about the place, right? Okay, so Minnie wasn't being serious, but the more I pondered on it, the better the idea became. So I messaged her back. Tell me more about that contest idea of yours. Then one time, when my mom was away on a business trip, I invited Minnie around. We spent all evening posting about the auditions online and handing flyers out around town. Soon, the applications came flooding in. Oh boy, some were handsome, but some, yeah, they were so not. Um, delete, definitely. 
we got everything ready to spend hours sifting through all the applicants. Gotta be strict, cause the chosen one had to be perfect like Prince Paris, to match with a woman like my mom, whose name is actually Helen. <laughs> Finally, we whittled them down to a top 10 list, and we invited them along to round one. Fitness is important, right? Well, at least that's what Minnie says. So we set up an assault course at the local park. All the guys showed up, including Mr. Swanson, my gym teacher. Uh-oh, awkward. But hey, I suppose he was good looking and a physically strong man. Firstly, they had to run a complete lap of the field, as stamina was important. Then they had to lift 120 pounds of weights, equal to my mom's weight. She sure needed a man who could lift her over their shoulder like they do in the movies. OMG, watching them warming up was hilarious. One man showed up in this lycra one piece and started doing jumping jacks, and another guy was doing some weird karate moves. All of them completed the running section. Well, just about, but some of them struggled to lift the weights, including Mr. Swanson, who had turned bright red and was groaning. Minnie and I covered our mouths to hold back our laughs. Farewell, Mr. Swanson. That was for being mean to us in gym class. Finishing round one, we eliminated three men. Too bad, as they were handsome. On to round two. It's not all about brawn. Brains are important too. That was why Minnie and I spent two days noting down all the questions for our who wants to be my mom's boyfriend quiz round. My mom deserves a man who knows everything. We set out a row of kid-sized chairs in the backyard. Then we walked along the line and fired questions at them. Suddenly, one man stood up and furiously said to the others, Why are we letting some kids test us like this? Then stormed off. Minnie whispered, Not surprising, really. I saw him scratching his head at the other questions. We then eliminated those with the lowest score, leaving just five potentials to go through to round three. That night, I was about to grab something to eat, and I saw my mom standing in the kitchen. Hmm, she was back earlier than I thought. She was looking down at the pile of profiles on the table with in and out stamps on them. Confused, she asked me, Zara, what is the meaning of this? Mom, we think you've been lonely for a long time, so Minnie and I are doing a contest to find you a man. I gave my best puppy-eyed look. Actually, tomorrow is round three. It'd be perfect if you could join us for the interview, please. Mom glared at me and shook her head, but I kept insisting until she sighed and said, fine, I'll come. I howled with joy and hugged her. Bring on round three, the interview stage. Minnie and I asked the questions while Mom, Queen Helen, watched from her throne. The first one, Tyler, waved over at Mom and said, Helen, do you recognize me? My mom just smiled politely. Turned out, Tyler had a big crush on my mom since they were both in high school. Then when Minnie asked him to show us his talent, he ignored her and said to mom, Oh, Helen, I've never stopped loving you. You remember back then when we... I shouted out, interrupting him. Not impressive enough. Next! The second one stepped in. Simon. Ooh. He was wearing a suit and seemed like a gentleman. Maybe you don't recognize me, Simon spoke up. My mom's smile disappeared. I'm Simon, the head of the engineering department in our company. Simon must have had a crush on my mom for a long time, but she sure didn't even know he existed. His talent performance was to help fix two faulty computers in my house. Hmm, useful, but honestly, it wasn't rocking enough. Plus, him being my mom's colleague was awkward. Duh! As soon as the third one, James, walked in, Mum sat up with a surprise. Helen, I miss you so much, he sincerely said. Mom immediately motioned me to eliminate him, then got up and went inside. It was revealed that James was her ex-boyfriend from their college days. Okay, creep. Oh well, two guys left. The next one was so dreamy. He looked like he belonged in a boy band. Minnie and I clasped hands excitedly. Hi, I'm Daniel. Nice to meet you, ladies. Daniel's smile totally melted Minnie and I. I don't know if you ladies know, but I live on this street. Seriously? How did I not know a handsome neighbor like this? 
He then took out his guitar and played a song. OMG, this guy deserves straight A's. But he was only 21 years old. That was way younger than my mom. And he was the last one of all. Very handsome and sweet. For his talent, he'd make us cupcakes. These lovely little ones are specially made for you, lovely ladies. He smiled. Oh, oh, how charming. In the end, Minnie and I sat together and discussed our options. Well, the result was quite obvious. I excitedly announced, We've made our decision. My new daddy, the chosen Prince Paris to my mom, Helen, the champion is... Andy! He looked chuffed and grinned over at my mom. Still, my mom maintained that polite smile and remained silent. Yay! This was great! I finally had a father. Moreover, this one makes awesome food. I couldn't wait for their first date. Eek! Now let me tell you, the date went amazingly. Andy took my mom and I to this fancy restaurant in town. He pulled the chairs out for us, ordered food he thought we'd like, then he started serving us the coolest stories ever. He really is a gentleman. If I had a boyfriend, I would want one like him. After we finished, I crossed the street to buy ice cream and caught them hugging. Perfect. Looked like things went well. Oh, Andy, I could already imagine the life where he was family. That night, Mom sat down next to me while I was texting and watching TV. Zara, I'm glad to see you had fun these past few days. I hummed, still texting. But did it ever cross your mind that what you did was for you and not for me? Excuse me? I worked hard to make her happy, and she could say that to me? I took my eyes off the phone and stared at her. Sweetie, you only picked the man you liked the best. It's your choice, not mine. I appreciate what you did, but relationships are not that simple. I tearfully raised my phone and shook it, saying that I already invited Andy over at the weekend to teach me how to cook. Mom smiled. No problem. Andy and I already talked and decided to stay friends. So this weekend's plan remains the same. I lowered my head and apologized to her. Mom was right. I'd picked my favorite without considering her feelings. But yeah, it wasn't all bad, as after that, Andy kept coming over most weekends took me to go buy groceries with him, and then cooked for us. He taught me how to cook and bake, and we even chatted about the goofy boys at my school. Seriously, if that Richard wants a chance with a pretty girl like ours, Zara, then he should be stronger, Andy said, while his hands were still cooking gracefully. Yeah, Richard, burn! Speaking of being burnt, ouch! Yes, it was me who had just burnt myself in the oven thinking about all this. Andy rushed over, guided my hand over to the faucet, and ran it under cold water. Oh, jeez. He was so caring and thoughtful. Unlike those childish guys my age. Soon it was my sweet 16th. And of course, Andy was the chef for dinner. Mum and Minnie just had to light up the birthday candles. Then, as I watched Andy through the candlelight, I knew I couldn't lie to myself anymore. I was in love with him. I spent days planning for the best confession to him. Only, before I could tell him how I felt, Mom told me, Andy just called me and said he'd been offered the head chef job in New York. He's leaving next week. What? No! Why? It was Andy, the first love of my life. That was so unfair. We didn't get any chance to see him until the day he boarded. Mom and I went to the airport to see him off. I couldn't bear watching him go, so I glued my eyes on the floor while he was still excitedly chatting with my mom. Zara, use what I taught you to take good care of your mother, okay? Andy winked and patted my head. I couldn't help myself any longer. I burst into tears, hugged him, and sobbed out, Andy, I love you. Please don't go. Don't leave me. I can't live without you. For a moment, the whole airport, including my mom, was stunned. All eyes were on me. Andy immediately pushed me away, clearing his throat and said, <clears throat> Zora, you're a lovely, pretty, sweet girl. You will find a suitable boyfriend. Then he turned to mom. Best wishes to you both. Bye, Helen. Bye, Zora. 
and I watched him walk away with tears streaming down on my face. Well, it's been six months since then, and I eventually realized that my feelings for Andy were just a teenage confusion. I did love him, yes, but it was more like admiring and respecting him as a father figure. Anyway, I do have a new dad now, but it was my beloved mom's choice. His name is Harris, and he might not be as good a cook as Andy, but he's a nice guy, and he makes her happy. And of course, we still keep in touch with Andy. Both his career and his love life are doing really well in the Big Apple. I've learned my lesson. Life's full of choices, some good and some not so good. But sometimes, however much we want to, we can't make choices for other people. Instead, we just have to take a deep breath and let them make their own. High school has started, and it's going pretty well. I'm currently seeing this very cute guy in math class. Guys my age are not that bad, to be honest. Minnie's not so bad on herself, either, as she's now dating that musician Daniel and enjoys touring around with him whenever he plays at concerts. What a happily fulfilled ending for everyone, isn't it? I was out for my afternoon jog and decided to take a new route. Suddenly, I saw a huge European-style mansion and had to stop to gaze at it. The walls were covered in moss, and honestly, it looked pretty eerie. I looked up, and a flock of crows were standing on the roof cawing. It sent shivers up my spine and immediately made me think of movies like The Conjuring or something. Wouldn't be surprised if that house was haunted. Suddenly, I got startled by the voice of an old lady. The mansion looks magnificent, doesn't it? I turned to look at her, and she continued. But you'd better stay away from it. Why? I asked her. Then she looked at me more closely and said, Oh, you aren't a local here, are you? I told her I was from Minnesota but that my parents had said I could spend the summer here with my aunt. Well, dear, let me tell you. The owner of this mansion was a young girl, super rich, but kept herself to herself. Rumor has it, she worshipped Satan. Can you believe it? I asked her, so where is she now? Oh, she mysteriously disappeared years ago, and the house has been abandoned ever since, the lady replied. Okay, this was seriously freaky. My hair was literally standing on end. But for some reason, I was more intrigued than ever. Oh, sorry, I should have introduced myself. I'm Ellie, a typical high school student, but also an avid detective story blogger. I spend a lot of my time on detective story forums and have always been attracted to weird and mysterious things ever since I was a little kid. Anyway, back to my story. So, one night, my aunt asked me to pop over to the grocery store to get some milk. On my way back, I passed the mansion and instantly got shivers. I looked up and saw a light flickering in a window on the second floor, like a candle or something. But, no way. The old lady said the place was abandoned, right? The light kept flickering, and I couldn't stop watching. Suddenly, a shadow of a girl appeared. She was playing the violin, and the gloomy music was wafting through the cracks in the walls. Then, out of nowhere, a crow flew by screaming, Gah! I almost leapt out of my skin and ran straight home. How could anyone live in that freaky mansion? Wait a minute. What if I'd just seen the ghost of the owner who disappeared? Oh man, I had to figure this mystery out. I could even turn it into a detective story with a bit of horror thrown in for fun. As I lay there, I came up with the title, Real Life Death Mansion. And then I realized I could even make a YouTube video about it with real photos of the house and maybe even some footage taken inside as I uncover the mystery. Oh, this would be so good. I could barely sleep from excitement, and the next day, I asked my cousin Susan to come along and explore the mansion with me. 
Hey, Susan, want to come check out that creepy mansion with me? O-M-G, Ellie, are you crazy? You know that place is haunted, right? Like, full of ghosts and everything. Yeah, that's why I asked you to go with me. I shrugged. I would rather make a detour than walk past that house to get home. So what makes you think I would dare to go inside? I tried to convince her it would be fun, but she kept refusing. Oh well, if no one dared to go into that mansion, then I shall be the first. Gathering up my courage, I went there alone. I managed to climb over the rusty iron fence that had almost fallen to pieces in the backyard. Then I noticed a door that was slightly ajar. As I got closer, I realized a satanic symbol was engraved on the door. Creepy! I closed my eyes, held my breath, and gently pushed the door open. The smell that hit me made me feel dizzy. A musty, abandoned kind of smell. I walked into the lounge, and it felt like I just walked into some old castle in France or something. There were cobwebs everywhere, and some massive ones hanging from the chandeliers. I looked around and noticed a portrait of a girl on the wall. She was beautiful, but her eyes looked so sad. Oh my, was this the owner? The one I'd seen playing the violin? I couldn't bear to look at the portrait any longer. It felt like her eyes were piercing my soul. I headed for the stairs and crept up as quietly as possible. I won't lie, I was terrified. It was so dark up there, and with every step I took, the floorboards creaked. I kept looking behind me, as it sounded like someone was following me. By this point, I'd broken out into a cold sweat. When I made it to the second floor, there was a long corridor ahead, but it was really weird. There was only one door. I walked towards it and pushed it open. It was a luxury room, definitely fit for a princess. And yep, there was the violin. Everything was coated in a thick layer of dust, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a picture. It was the same girl, but this time, her eyes were glowing red like fire, just like Sauron, the villain in The Lord of the Rings. I was so scared that I quickly turned the photo face down. This was when I heard the violin sound from somewhere. Okay, what was going on? The violin was right before my eyes, and I was supposed to be the only one in the house? I tried to calm down, took a deep breath, and walked in the direction of the sound next door. It was so weird, because the next door was an exact replica of the first room. Had I actually changed rooms? I walked towards the dressing table and noticed the photo in here was also turned face down. I picked it up, and it was the exact same photo, but this time, the face of the girl was bleached white. I dropped the photo in horror and ran off without looking back. I ran down the stairs three at a time, but when I reached the door, it was locked. I started banging on it, and by then I was hysterically crying. Help! Help me! I screamed. Suddenly, someone's hand touched my shoulder. My heart had definitely jumped out of my chest. Ah! Uh, ah! I yelled at the top of my lungs, but when I turned around, there was this young guy standing there. A pretty cute one. Who, who are you? I stuttered. He frowned at me and said, Who are you? And why are you here? I, I... I could barely speak as I was shaking so much. Then the guy said, Come on, let's get out of here. You look horrified. Then he took out a key and opened the door. Are... are you a ghost or something? I stuttered. He started laughing and said, Pretty creepy place, right? I asked him if he saw the photos too, and he said, Yes, terrifying. Like something out of a horror movie, I added. Exactly. Perfect setting for a horror movie. I stared in confusion, and he laughed and said, Yup, we're making a movie. I mean, I'm gonna rent this place to make a horror movie. Then he introduced himself as Jack, a young director who was interested in detective and horror movies. He was just checking the place out to see if it was suitable. I couldn't believe it. Wow, 
This is literally a dream come true. I've been writing detective stories since I could hold a pen, and I've always hoped I'd become a screenwriter on horror and detective movies one day. I'm so honored to meet you. I'm Ellie, by the way. Then Jack replied, The pleasure's all mine. It's a pretty exciting industry to be in. I'd love to read some of your stuff sometime. I couldn't stop grinning. Then suddenly, another person showed up. Jack introduced him as Michael, a member of his film crew. But compared to how friendly Jack was, Mike was serious and intimidating. Jack could tell that I was nervous, so he laughed and said, Michael's been under a lot of stress, so he looks a bit grumpy, right? I just smiled shyly and asked Jack if I could have his number. As I walked home, I couldn't believe how happy I felt. Who knew such a scary adventure would turn into an epic opportunity? I texted Jack right away, saying I would love to learn more about his film, and I had to admit, I might have had a slight crush on him. He was so cute. I kept checking my phone, but he hadn't replied. That was so disappointing. But then, a few days later, he asked me out for coffee. I was so excited, and seriously, we had the best time. He even offered to drive me home. When I got into the car, he told me to close my eyes. Eek! Maybe he was going to kiss me. I was so nervous, but suddenly, something hit my face, and I didn't know anything else. When I woke up, I found myself in some kind of warehouse, with my hands and feet tied, and my mouth taped shut. Oh my god, had I been kidnapped? Where was Jack? Suddenly... I heard a noise outside. I looked through the window and saw Jack and Michael talking to each other. What? Did the two of them plan this? But why? A moment later, Michael left, and Jack came towards me and removed the tape from my mouth. I started screaming. Why are you doing this to me? Then Jack said, Listen, I'm not going to hurt you, I swear, but there's something I need to tell you. Then he confessed that he was a member of a criminal organization named Iron Gloves. His gang were operating from the mansion, and so everything from the story of the mysterious missing girl, the ghost playing the violin, the eerie photos, were all made up by them. They did it so that no one would dare approach their headquarters. According to the gang's rules, any outsider that entered the mansion would be killed to protect the secrecy of the group. Michael had seen me enter and reported it to the boss. So Jack had been forced to carry out the mission, but he didn't want to do it. So that's why he pretended to kidnap me. Dear good God, this was too much. He asked me to leave right away, but I was worried about him. He said, don't worry, I've been wanting to leave for a long time. And so I have a plan. Fast forward two years. And now, I'm a freshman majoring in screenwriting. It's so exciting chasing my passion, but I still think that summer at my aunt's was one of my best yet. Terrifying, but thrilling. Oh, and as for Jack, after we chatted in the warehouse, he let me go, and I quickly packed up all my stuff at my aunt's and flew home. A few weeks later, I saw an article that said he'd turned himself in, and that the police had caught the Iron Gloves gang. Now, Jack's in prison, but will soon be free. I have a feeling that deep down, he's a good guy, and I hope that I'll have the chance to meet him again and get to know the real him better. Who knows? His real-life experience might help me write one hell of an awesome story, too. Oh my god, Evan! Let's get married on April 3rd! What? Are you serious? Yeah, look! Then she waved her phone in my face. On the screen was some article about choosing special dates to get married. It's 040321. We could get married anyways, right? So why not choose a unique date? And you'll never forget our wedding anniversary. Uh, but babe, that's three days away. Uh, how are we gonna arrange a wedding in such a short time? She jumped to her feet. We will marry on this special date. Then she ran off upstairs. She was kidding, right? As this idea was insane. Oh, by the way, that was Mila, my girlfriend. And I'm Evan, and we've been dating for over a year now.
I didn't give any more thought to her mad idea, but then later I saw her making all these calls to wedding locations and everything, and that's when I realized she wasn't kidding. Unsurprisingly, all the local wedding venues were fully booked for that date. So Mila came up with a crazy plan. We would drive to the wedding capital of the world, Vegas. My God, this was lunacy. But Mila wouldn't take no for an answer, so it was settled. We were going to Vegas, baby. Um, there's one problem. We live in Alaska, so the trip would take us about two days and 16 hours. We called into work to take a few days off, and then we woke up super early and began our long journey to Vegas. I have to admit that I was kind of excited about our adventure, but little did we know how many ridiculous situations we would come across on our way. We started the journey at 5.30, and only a few hours in, Mila got peckish, so she started munching on our snack supply. Later on, I was craving potato chips too, so I asked her to feed me some. But to my horror, none of the snacks were left, and we hadn't even crossed city limits yet. That's not humanly possible. Then, when we reached the highway, she suddenly said she needed a pee. I stopped at the nearest service station, but she didn't go to the restroom. Instead, she turned to me and said, Actually, uh, since we're here now, why don't we go grab some lunch? Excuse me? But it was 10 a.m. And didn't she just eat all our snacks? I knew it was pointless arguing with a hungry girl, so I just followed her. After that, we hit the road again. I was getting a bit bored, so I reached for my phone to turn on some Post Malone, but Mila stopped me and said that she had something far more interesting. The audio novel to all the boys I've ever loved before. Jesus. It was so boring that it almost sent me to sleep. So for the safety of our lives and the lives of other drivers, I decided to stop at a motel to get some sleep. Besides, I couldn't endure hearing any more of Laura Jean and this guy Peter. The next day after breakfast at a diner, we were walking to our car when Mila suddenly saw a pregnant woman loading stuff into her trunk. She immediately ran over to the lady, then told me to do the heavy loading while she just stood there and chatted to her. Suddenly, the lady touched her stomach and said that she wasn't feeling well. Oh, oh my God, don't tell me that she was going to... Oh boy, her water broke! Quick, we need to get her in your car and take her to the hospital! My car? <laughs> what if the baby comes out? But Mila didn't listen and was already helping the lady get into the back seat. My God. I hope the baby didn't slip out too soon or else I'd have to burn my car. Let me drive. You sit in the back with her. Her husband isn't here, so she needs a man for emotional support. What? That sounded absurd, but there was no time to argue. The lady began to scream because of the pain. I tried to calm her down by telling her to breathe in and out, but she just shouted, Shut up! Then held my hand and squeezed it really hard. Oh my God, she was going to break my fingers like toothpicks. It hurt so much I began to scream with her. Thank God we got the lady to the hospital on time. Phew, I couldn't imagine what would happen to my hand and my car if the baby had arrived any sooner. So the journey continued. As we were driving through Fort Nelson, I saw a guy holding a sign asking for a ride to the nearest service station. Of course, I ignored the dude and wanted to drive past him, but my girl Mila over here just couldn't seem to brush that aside. She made me stop the car and warmly welcomed him into our car. Ugh, that was so annoying. While I was driving, I smelled something really awful. My God, it was so smelly that I couldn't breathe. It had to be this dude. I gave Mila an angry glare, but she just gave me a guilty smile back. Well, at least she had to suffer too. I had no choice but to open the windows on a highway. Mila clutched her head as she shouted, Are you crazy? Close the windows! The wind is ruining my hair! Oh my God, was her hair more important than her nose? Thank God, after 30 minutes, we reached a service station and the guy got out of my car. I went to the restroom to freshen myself up, and when I came back, Mila was nowhere to be found. I was about to call her, but oh man, I left my phone in the car and she had the keys. After 45 minutes of searching, I gave up and went back to the car to find her sitting there, her arms folded as she glared at me. Um, where have you been? You do realize we have a tight schedule to keep. What? Was she serious? Then I suddenly heard someone coughing in the back. I turned around and to my horror saw a little boy sitting there. What the... Why was there a kid in my car? Mila explained that his school bus had left without him and we needed to take him to his camping location. Not again, Mila. Why does she have to be that sweet little angel who couldn't help but have to help everybody? But my God, now there was not the time to be Charlie's angels and rescue that little kid. I told her, but she immediately accused me of being heartless, cruel, and everything. Jesus. That's the third person I'd given a free ride to today. 
As I was driving to the camping location, the kids suddenly felt nauseous. I shouted at him to hold it as we were on the highway, and it was impossible to stop. But he started to make vomit sounds. Mila freaked out, so she grabbed something and let the kid throw up in there. After I found a place to stop, I turned around and saw that Mila threw all my stuff out and used my precious Nike duffel bag as a vomit bag. That's it. I'd had enough. So I shouted at the kid, Get out of my car! He got so scared that he ran out and started crying really loudly. That wasn't cool. He's just a scared little kid. How would you like it if your school bus left you behind? Okay, maybe I was a bit harsh on the kid. You can't blame me. It'd been a long couple of days and that was my favorite bag, but but still, I went outside to comfort the kid. Hey, please don't cry. I'm really sorry for earlier. I, I didn't mean to shout at you. I'm just really tired from all that driving. The kid stopped crying, but still looked very scared of me. So I said, hey, if you give me a smile, I promise to buy you some candy later. He immediately smiled and hugged me. Oh great, I was sure Mila didn't wipe his mouth clean after all that throwing up as I got some vomit stains on my shirt. But hey, the hug kind of felt nice. We dropped the kid off and his teachers were very grateful. But because of everything we'd been through today, there was no way we could rest in a motel and make it on time to Vegas. So the only option was to drive through the night, so Mila took the wheel so I could catch some Z's. A honking sound startled me and I sat up and saw that we were going at a snail's pace. Mila, what's wrong? You're driving slower than my granny! I think we're lost. What? Why didn't she wake me up? Then, oh no, we suddenly heard a cop siren. And guess why we were pulled over? Yup, for driving too slowly in a 60 mile an hour zone. My god, I was freaking out. But Mila turned to me and said, Just keep quiet and I'll do the talking. She opened the window and began to speak in a weird way. Hi, officer. Did I do something wrong? Can I see your license, please? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Here you go, officer. Good looking. It's Goodlin. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Please don't look in my picture. I was having a bad hair day when I took it. Oh, dear God, was she actually flirting with the cop? He looked at her license with a frown on his face. Oh, no, we'd end up being locked up. Well, Miss Forrester, I think you look great in this picture. I'll let you off with a warning this time, but please be more careful. Driving at 20 in a 60-mile-an-hour zone is more dangerous than it sounds. Oh, oh, my God, thank you so much. Today must be my lucky day. I'm stopped by not only a very handsome, but also kind-hearted officer. If I don't get married tomorrow, I will definitely get your number. My God, I think he gets it. After that, I didn't talk to her the whole night. How could she flirt with another man right in front of me? And now we had less than 16 hours to get to Vegas and get married. So we grabbed a quick breakfast from a diner, then carried on driving. On the plus side, we finally crossed the Canadian border. We were in Montana, baby. Then Mila turned to me and grumbled out, FYI, you forgot to close the window again. Anything could have crawled inside while we were at that diner. Ugh, was she serious? I didn't have the time nor the patience for this, so I just nodded to let it go. We sat in silence, but suddenly I heard squeaking. No way was that Mila. Oh my god, something must be in my car. I pulled over and looked in the back seat to see a skunk jumped out right at me. We both screamed and got out of the car. While I was trying to think of a way to get rid of it, Mila suddenly pointed. Um, do you realize the car is rolling down that hill? I turned around and the car was really moving. I must have forgotten to pull the handbrake. We chased after it, but luckily it rolled into a muddy patch. I looked inside and phew, at least the skunk had gone. I tried driving away, but the car made an awful sound and only seemed to sink lower into the mud. So I went outside to push the car and Mila switched to the driver's seat, but then mud splashed everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I mean everywhere. I called out for her to stop, but guess what? She didn't hear me over the music she just had to play. Unbelievable. While here I was, covered in dirt. But, well, as annoying as the loud music was, the weekend's blinding lights kind of boosted me up somehow, which made me push the car as hard as I could. And yes, it got out of the mud. I was tired, dirty, hungry, and I just wanted to get to Vegas in one piece. Was that too much to ask? I think God heard my prayers, because we made it to Las Vegas, baby. And it was 11.30 p.m. I had about 10 minutes to shower and change, but Mila insisted that we go straight into the chapel. My God, Mila. I looked like I'd been wrestling John Cena in a mud bath. We ran towards the reception, and when I looked at my watch, it was 11.45 p.m. Oh my God, I couldn't believe we made it. The past three days felt like three freaking months. 
Hi, it's uh, 040321, and we're here to get married. The reception frowned at us, then said, Sorry, sweetie, but it's the 4th. Then she pointed at the calendar on her desk. Huh? Had we jumped time or something? Then I had a light bulb moment. Nevada is one hour ahead of Alaska. My God, we totally forgot about that. It was already April 4th. Mila looked devastated, and I was feeling a bit down about it too. But if I really had been a groom with this muddy look, I never would have dared look at the wedding pictures ever. Moreover, after everything we'd been through on this trip, I think it's best we get to know each other a bit more before we get married. I'm already happy with what we're having right now, so no need to rush, right? <laughs>